Welcome back to the Leaving Eden podcast. My name is Gabriel Hakoen. Call me Gavi. We're all friends here. Call me Gavi. Uh, and I am here with my BFF. How are you doing today, Sadie? I am doing great. I'm really excited to get into this episode. I'm excited as well. This is going to be a good one. And this is one that we've had in the cards for a long time. Sadie, do you want to tell the people what it is? Yeah. So today we are going to talk about... Bob Jones University. Also known as BJU. Yeah. So BJU is the alma mater, uh, not only of our excellent guest, Liz Hunter, but also some of our longest standing fans like Jenny, who has written into the show on multiple occasions. This episode today, we're mostly going to focus on the history of BJU and how it influenced fundamentalism. But one day I would love to do an episode where we hear some listener stories as well. Yeah, this is a really big one. Um, BJU seems like it, like it's it's really a a major school for fundamentalists. Like this is this is like one of the pillars of how even fundamentalism developed in this country. So this is really exciting. It is. And this may be the most sources that I have ever had for a Leaving Eden episode. (laughs) I'm so proud of you, Sadie. Sadie did massive, massive, massive amounts of research. So uh, to if you want to see my sources, there's like additional reading. There's backup for just about everything in this episode. These source posts are on Patreon, uh, patreon.com slash leaving Eden. But you are able to access those whether or not you have a Patreon account and whether or not you subscribe to us or give us any money. They are free and they're open to anybody on the Internet. That will be linked in the show notes so you can go through my sources as needed. Not a lot to say here at the top, but we have a lot to get through. So I'm just going to get right into it. The Leaving Eden podcast is the podcast about my BFF and co-host Sadie Carpenter's life in and escape from the independent fundamental Baptist cult, the cult in which she was raised. We talk about this cult. We talk about other cults. We talk about religion. We talk about fundamentalism. We talk about the real and present threat that cults and cult ideologies pose to society as a whole and is our goal to promote freedom of mind, freedom of thought, and freedom of religion. So if you like our show, if you're a fan of our show, then you can join our Patreon, which is Patreon patreon.com slash leaving eden podcast where there are extended and uncensored versions of most of our episodes you can join our facebook group which is facebook.com slash groups slash eden exodus you can join our subreddit which is reddit.com slash r slash eden exodus and if you want to write into us send us messages if you have an experience that you'd like to share or if you have a question for us send us a message at leaving eden pod at gmail.com uh, do i have anything else to say before i thank our faith promise missions to your patrons and our i gave it all to your patrons i think that that's it for the moment. Faith Promise Missions and I gave it all to your patrons. These are really the people who make it financially viable for us to actually do this show. Like we said just a few minutes ago, Sadie uh, especially puts in a massive, massive, massive amount of research uh, into a lot of the episodes, this one in particular. Um, and in order for her to be able to devote the time to do that, it's it's great that we have that level of financial support, uh, support from our listeners, um, from our patrons. So without further ado, I want to thank our two, I gave it all to your patrons. First, Kathleen Moncrief, who's been a patron for such a long time. She's so great. We love you, Kathleen. And... Melissa Mosley, who was the first person to ever subscribe to the I Gave It All tier of the Patreon and the first person to ever get access to our extremely sus outtakes <laughs> reel that you get if you subscribe to the I Gave It All tier patron. Uh, Thank Patreon. you so much to Kathleen and to Melissa for your incredible levels of support. <laughs> yeah, like re- like really above and beyond. Um the Faith Promise Missions tier patrons, um, and we have to do we have to schedule a, 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 a Zoom call with all of them coming soon. That's going to be super fun to do that again. And there's a lot of new faces here, so we get to new, meet new people, which will be really fun. But our Faith Promise Missions tier patrons are Alex Todd, Anisha Patel, Brittany, it's Brittany, bitch, Brooke Tolly, Carrie R, Krissa, Crystal Patterson. Eleanor Donahue, Elizabeth DeWorth. Oh, I think that's a new one. Um, Emery Fairlosser, Ethan Hansen, Ethan Hansen, Ethan Hansen. Isn't that a musical? No, that's Evan Hansen. Yes. 
yeah, Hannah Ross, Hope Norum, Jen Kaharski, Jessica Tambo, Kay Terwee, Catherine Schneider, Kristen Marie, Linda Morgan, Lindsay Goss, Lorena Watson, Michaela Upright, Madeline Antrim, Madeline Cusick, Mary Martin, Meg, Megan Arendt, Mike Smith, Miranda Day, Rachel Bernadowitz, Rebecca Hoyt, Reverend Robert Stutes, Sarah Reese, Shane Horton, Stephanie Johnson, Susie, Tiffany Enderby, Walnut Walnutson, Wes the Cowboy, and finally, not Gavi's BFF. Oh, you're, <laughs> damn. Okay, just... I forgot she changed it again. She changed it to being like... I, I, you know what? I get, I get being Sadie's BFF, but I don't get like specifying that you're not my BFF. That that feels especially mean. Um, well, but, maybe that's just because you haven't put in the work. Okay, like I have. That's true. She she seems like the person that you have to like work hard to get close to. Uh, well, and, and, not really. really. You just have it. to send her Starbucks. That's oh, that's okay. about it. Morgan, <laughs> Morgan, and I have sent the same ten dollars to each other over starbucks gift cards um like four or five times now oh well that's sweet yeah just friend stuff yeah. anyway thank you to all of our faith promise missions to your patrons you're the best you're the best you're the best uh sadie just hit us with that tw for this episode and then we can get right into it sorry if i just rushed through a lot of these names we have a lot to get to today we do but i do want to say thank you to all of our patrons who continue to make this show possible So in general, we talk about a lot of potentially triggering topics on this show, including but not limited to suicide and mental health, racism, misogyny, PTSD, PTSD symptoms, child abuse, mental, physical, and sexual abuse, and spiritual abuse, including guilt, shame, and fear. In most episodes, at least a few of these things are bound to come up. It's just the nature of talking about cult-like groups and cults and the IFB. What we do try to do is we avoid graphic details of these things unless those details are highly relevant to the story that we're telling. This episode in particular is about Bob Jones University and how the history of fundamentalist school intersects with the history of American fundamentalism itself. The big trigger warnings for this episode are racism and sexual abuse and really, really disgusting victim blaming. There is so much of all of these in this episode the racism is just everywhere. It is it is just throughout the episode. The specifics of the sexual abuse and the victim blaming are con- more contained to one part of the episode, so I will let you know before that comes up. Cool, cool, cool. Are we ready to get into it? Let's let's do it. I, I am really hyped about this one. So, so when I've heard people talk about uh, the fundamentalism, like Christian fundamentalism in the United States, it seems like they're they often refer to a couple of different schools, like a couple of different colleges. The ones, the main ones that I hear about are Liberty University, which uh, is, is people sort of see as like, if you're a fundamentalist and you want to go into politics, mm-hmm. then Liberty University is the place for you. But Bob Jones University is seen as more of like the cultural side. Mm-hmm. Yes. The, the, the difference between Liberty and Bob Jones is that Liberty was founded in 1971. For reference, Hiles Anderson was founded in 1972 and Pensacola Christian College was founded in 1974. These are colleges that we maybe associate more strongly with the modern IFB. They came about during a resurgence of fundamentalism and they shaped the resurgence of fundamentalism that we saw in the late 70s and 80s, the Reagan years. But Bob Jones University has a lot longer history. It was founded in 1927. So it has had more time to influence American fundamentalism. So to understand BJU, we have to go back to the state of Christianity in America after World War I. We've talked on the show about the history of American religion in kind of an overview sense. Today, we're going to continue that and we're going to see it through the lens of Bob Jones. This is the story of American fundamentalism in the 20th century. We've talked about uh, in the July 4th episode this year about how the Establishment Clause came about and how the seeds of Christian nationalism were planted before the Constitution was even ratified. 
we talked in the Chevy episode and I think in the Called to Preach episode about the first and second Great Awakenings, how religion and specifically evangelical Protestantism ebbed and flowed between the Revolutionary War and the American Civil War. So there would be a time when evangelical Protestantism through whatever denomination was popular and people were going to big tent meetings or revival meetings, and then there would be another generation, 30 or 40 years, where it wasn't popular and these things were more under the radar. And that's kind of been a constant up and down throughout American history. We've also talked about the rise of end-time theology, which informs so much of not only uh, not only evangelical Christianity the way that we see it today, but also conspiracy theories like the Satanic Panic and QAnon and the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, which rose through William Miller. We talked about that in the Branch Davidians episode and kind of the split between the Baptists and the Seventh-day Adventists. Today, we're taking the next logical step in that history, and we're going to talk about post-World War I theological developments, because fundamentalism, the movement, didn't really happen in America until after World War I. We talked about in the FLDS episode about uh, fundamentalism as a belief structure, the fundamentals of what you believe in, the fundamentals of whatever the thing is that you believe in. Fundamentalism, the movement, however, is what started after World War I. So around the time of World War I, the world was beginning to feel more connected. Americans, both those who went to Europe as part of the war as soldiers or support, and the people who remained at home, were exposed to a lot of new ideas, and one of them was a theological movement that had been growing in Europe for several centuries since the Protestant Reformation. This theological movement was called higher criticism. Higher criticism, if if you've ever heard me talk about Christianity or Christian scriptures, you've heard a lot of higher criticism out of my mouth. Higher criticism divorces the scriptural text from the idea that it is word-for-word literal and applicable to our culture today in its word-for-word literal state. Higher criticism instead applies knowledge of the cultures in which the scripture was written and the view that the Bible is true and contains truth, but that every word may not be meant to be taken literally or applied literally today. It's the idea that Some parts of the Bible are immutable, permanent truth, but other parts might be metaphor or poetry or something that was intended for a particular culture or a particular time that is not our culture or our time. This is a binary. So you you either believe in biblical literalism like the IFB does, or you believe in higher criticism. Yeah, there is not a lot of wiggle room. So either you believe that Biblical stories and commandments are meant to be taken 100% literally in every era of human history, or you believe that they're less than 100% literal, but they contain truth that can be applied for any era. Those are pretty much the two points of view if you are a believer in Christian scripture. I think the most common example uh, that you would hear cited a lot is the story of Jonah and the whale although this can also apply really well to creation. But in the story of Jonah and the whale, either you believe that Jonah literally got swallowed by a whale and that is what happened, or you believe that, well, maybe he did get swallowed by a whale, maybe he didn't, but that's not the point of the story. The story is a myth and whether it actually happened or something similar happened doesn't really matter. What matters is the lessons that we can draw from it. And so this is also where the King James only ism comes from, because in order to believe that it's literally true, you have to agree on what the actual specific words are so that you can't be parsing translations. Right. King James only ism popped up a little bit later, but it is highly related to this idea. Because like you said, if you're going to take it word for word, literally, you have to have a word for word translation at the time that fundamentalism got its start, the King James Version was the only really commonly used version, so it wasn't a question, but it became a question over the next couple decades. When American Christians seemed to be in danger of succumbing to the evils of higher criticism, 64 different authors wrote a series of essays anonymously published defending the constant, sorry, (laughs) Uh, 64 different authors wrote 
90 essays that were written to defend biblical literalism and what they saw to be the fundamentals of the Christian faith against higher criticism and against what they saw to be a new liberal theology. The liberal theology that the writers of the fundamentals were fighting against included the social gospel, which is the idea that Christians should embrace social programs, women's rights, anti-racism, and that sort of values as an extension of Jesus's work on earth. In other words, the best intentioned parts of what we would now call progressive Christianity are what the fundamentals were written to fight against. (laughs) So yes, this exact same war of attrition in American Christianity has been in progress for a little over 100 years. The belief Hmm. that the King James Version is the only valid version came along after other versions became popular or commonly used. But I think it wouldn't have happened without the fundamentals. So when I went to your house to meet your dad last year, Yes. Um, I think one of the one of the first converse, parts of the conversation that I had with him was he he basically told me, you know, he said, basically, I still believe the fundamentals of the Christian faith. It's just that he thinks the fundamentals are different things than he did when he was part of the IFB. Absolutely. So that's what he told me. I'm like, oh, OK, huh? And so he says, you know, I like and so he would say all of these all of these things. And I didn't know what they were. But so things like the virgin birth of Christ or the sinless nature of Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. So that made sense to me. Yeah. He still believed all of those things. So authors of this this group of essays called The Fundamentals, the authors were not all Baptists. There were Southern Baptist authors, Presbyterians, Episcopalians multiple other denominations alongside names that would be more familiar to those of us who grew up IFB, like R.A. Torrey, who was one of the three editors for this series of essays. The 60, what did I say, 64 men who wrote for the Fundamentals would not have all agreed with each other on every point of theology or practice. The Fundamentals were things that they felt every Christian ought to agree on the kind of things that my dad was referencing to you. Yeah. And that made a lot of sense to me when he said it, because when I, you know, when you and I hear and a lot of our listeners hear fundamentals, what do we think? We think of the, the no pants and we think, right. You know, the drinking all like all of the rules, the music and the styles or women's skirt lengths, but that's not what yeah. the fundamentals were actually about. Uh, they were about theological concepts. So is this a bit of like, them also playing a little bit of no true Scotsman where, you know, you have an idea of it's like, oh, well, if you don't believe in X then you're not really Christian, if you don't believe in Mm -hmm. that, like Jesus was a a virgin birth and 100% sinless, then you're not really Christian, which I don't know whether that's true or not. I don't know the merits of that. That is a statement that the majority of Christians would agree with. And even a lot of more progressive Christians, though, certainly not all would agree with. Huh? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. So the fundamentals, the the essay series, spent a lot of time on attacking and taking down other churches and religious organizations that they deemed to not be true Christians. Uh, this included Jehovah's Witnesses, Catholics, Mormons, and Christian Scientists, among others. And each one of those groups, they had a theological attack. Uh, Like Jehovah's Witnesses, I think, don't believe in the Trinity. So that was, unless I'm mistaken. So that was, it wasn't you're not true Christians because we don't like you. It was you're not true Christians because you don't agree with something on this list that we think all true Christians could agree with. Okay. Mormons, there is some weird different doctrine about Jesus than what other Christians believe. So that was their theological point of attack. So they spent some time on that. And then the rest of the essays were about, maybe you could call them the building blocks of Christianity, like the deity of Christ, the virgin birth, who the Holy Spirit is, how salvation works, uh, denying evolution, denying socialism. By the way, how salvation works, like ransom atonement versus penal substitutionary atonement, is the big thing that the Twitter people are fighting over right now. (laughs) So Uh. once again... (laughs) These this war between people who think this and people who think that has been going on for about a hundred years. The fundamentals aren't specifying which denomination of Protestant of Protestant Protestantism has it right. Well, that would be they? a little bit silly. 
Because they had writers and preachers and theologians from many denominations who wrote for the series. So if the if the Episcopalian author said, well, actually, we have it right, and then the Baptist author said, well, actually, no, we have it right, <laughs> that wouldn't make any sense. It wouldn't be a unified document. This was supposed to be the things that transcended denomination and united all Protestants. So how do you go from, we believe in the Holy Trinity, we believe that the Bible is true, to saying, women can't wear pants, but culottes are okay? That is a part of our topic for today. I'm really excited to jump into it. I felt like this was important, crucial background to understand the climate in which BJU was founded. What you have to understand from the jump, and we're going to track this splintering off effect throughout history, now throughout about, well, about the last hundred years, that at first, in the early 1900s, all of the different kinds of fundamentalists, so Baptist fundamentalists and Episcopal fundamentalists and non-denominational fundamentalists and Methodist fundamentalists, were all united against a common enemy. The common enemy was higher criticism and liberal Christian theology. And they felt that fighting that enemy was more important than denominational divides or styles of worship or different rules that they held themselves by. But as fundamentalists tend to do, <laughs> over the intervening decades between the publication of the fundamentals and now, fundamentalists split off into many, many splinter groups. And then those groups split off into many more splinter groups. Not only did they separate into denominations and become more insular within their denominations, but they separated into camps like we see with the independent Baptists, which is specifically prohibited by the New Testament. But you would think biblical literalists would know that, but apparently not. What do I know? <laughs> it's prohibited. <laughs> yeah. Say not, I am of Paul. Anyway, that's a, that's a pet peeve of mine. We can <laughs> let's talk about Bob Jones University. <laughs> I did. I didn't get that reference. Uh, but that's, that's because fine. it's from the New Testament. <laughs> yeah, I haven't seen that one. <laughs> okay, talk to us. Uh, t speaking of talk, talk about BJ. Okay, so Bob Jones Sr. was an evangelist in the golden age of evangelists, which was around 1900 to 1920. Dr. Bob Sr. was a contemporary of Billy Sunday. And if people like this episode, we might have to do one on Billy Sunday because he did prohibition. He like made that happen. It was wow. a whole thing. Yeah. Did you know that was one of ours? <laughs> um, anyway, Bob Jones had an interdenominational wow. background. He was raised by a Baptist father and a Methodist mother. And it seems like this maybe gave him a tendency to not really mind mixing denominations a bit. This is important to understand because not only did the IFB as we know it not exist yet when Bob Jones Sr. was making a name for himself, the IFB movement itself was born in the 40s and 50s through J. Frank Norris. But also, the denominations that held to any kind of fundamentalist traditional Christian teachings we're all uniting under the banner of fundamentalism in order to fight the common em enemy of liberalism, socialism, atheism, blah, 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 blah. So take a minute and think about when Dr. Bob Jones Sr. is rising to prominence, prominence as an evangelist, what else was going on in religion and culture at the time? This is the time of the Scopes Monkey Trial. So Bob Jones was born in the perfect time to be a fundamentalist evangelist. He was also born with the natural talent to be a fundamentalist evangelist. He, Billy Sunday, and others like them drew crowds of thousands of people. Fun fact, this is why fundamentalist mm. preachers yell so much. Because when Bob Jones and Billy Sunday were preaching to crowds of thousands, there was no PA. So they had to yell to be heard by everyone. And they had to make large gestures with their hands so that everyone could see them on stage. Really? Yes. This is why fundamentalist preachers yell. Because this is a stylistic thing that is that that is like intrinsic to fundamentalism and, and like this style to begin with. But mm -hmm. it's born. It's it was born out of necessity. 
Yep. That's and then it got passed down because the next generation of preacher who heard Dr. Bob preach or Billy Sunday preach thought, oh, he's yelling. I guess I better yell, too. And then the next generation and the next because they idolize men and they idolize preachers. So every generation just kind of copied the generation before. And now we've got guys yelling into a microphone because that's how it was done 100 years ago. So they're going to just be like yelling and screaming and yelling and screaming, even if there's only like two dozen people in the church and the church is like right. not a huge. OK, so it's like the equivalent of you, like you join a garage band and somebody has a hundred watt Marshall stack with like a four by 12 cabinet. And they're like, yeah, I got this. I got this Marshall stack. Let's let's do this garage band. And <laughs> You know, right. Like, it It is because that's what their musical idols have. And that's what is cool. And they don't need that kind of volume. But and in fact, having that kind of volume makes it like so you can't play with maybe anybody a little off putting yeah. to those around you. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. And so in 2022, this is in this is like officially enshrined in doctrine. Right. So now it's if, oh, well, if you don't yell, you're not a fundamentalist. And I want you to hold on to this thought. We're going to move on, but this is going to be a bit of a pattern. So disturbed by the rise of atheism and secularism in higher education in the secular world, evangelist Bob Jones decided to found an explicitly Christian Institute of Higher Education. Important to note, this is a liberal arts school, not a Bible college. So BJU is not just a school to get you ready for when like Jesus comes and fills you with the Holy Spirit. Right. As we've talked about when uh, we've explored the differences between Hiles Anderson and Pensacola and my different experiences there, Hiles Anderson is a Bible college. Pensacola is not. It's a liberal arts school. A Bible college exists only to train people for a future in Christian ministry as a pastor, a church staff member, or a missionary. That's it. You will not get skills that can be used outside of those narrow parameters, nor will you get credits that can be transferred toward a degree doing anything else. A Christian liberal arts college like Pensacola or BJU, however, exists to teach all sorts of subjects leading to all sorts of career paths from a Christian perspective. So if you want to be an evolution scientist, (laughs) you're pretty screwed. Uh, If you want to be a psychologist, (laughs) don't recommend. But if you really, really, really want to be an accountant, but you cannot sit in a class where they don't pray to open the class or like there aren't Bible verses in your accounting textbook, or if you really want to be an engineer, but you can't live without taking Bible classes for all of your electives and learning about how God holds up the foundation of the earth and God made gravity, that's what a Christian liberal arts school is for. So it's probably easier to recruit people to BJU than it is to recruit people to like Jack Hiles uh, College. Yeah, because there are so many more opportunities. So Hmm. BJU was founded in Florida uh, before the Great Depression in the 1920s. Uh, Bay County, Florida. It's in the panhandle. Okay. So BJU. Okay. I'm looking. So BJU, you're getting all the way down to the base of the uh, peninsula. Right. But with the Depression suppressing college admissions, BJU was priced out of Florida and they had to move to Tennessee. Through the Depression and into the 1940s, BJU remained a small college with only between 100 and a few hundred students. One article I read preparing for this episode described fundamentalism as being in a hibernation at this time. And I thought that was a, a perfect description. During this time, during um, American history, there were tons of these small colleges like all over the country, too. Like oh, like a lot of them, like they could be religious um, or not religious, but because literacy wasn't as universal as it is now. Like everything had to be local because there wasn't like the, the Internet. There wasn't like a global economy the way that there is now. And it was really much more likely that if you were a young adult and you were the kind of person who would be going to college, you would be like a teenager or you would be a young adult and you would still be living with your family, even if you were working. So lots of cities or towns would have a, a small private or a small religious college. And many of them like now they're defunct. But a lot of them stuck around and that's where you would go. Uh, And that's uh, like and there would just be like a few professors, but they would teach like a variety of subjects. Each professor would teach it. This is like. Mm -hmm. 
yeah, these small city colleges were really a thing at the time. That's what was going on in education in fundamentalism. Fundamentalism had fallen out of fashion after the monkey trial. We're going to have to talk about it, but William Jennings Bryan's performance in William Jennings Bryan's performance in the monkey trial was a was an embarrassment um and I feel my dad glaring down at me for saying that. <laughs> Sorry, Dad. Really? He would he would not have approved of me saying that. Why? What was his his uh He was a big fan of William Jennings Bryant. Um but his embarrassment was re- or his performance was really an embarrassment to fundamentalists and William Jennings Bryan died like two days after the trial. And it is hypothesized that how badly that trial went for him may have done him in. That's how bad it was. Fundamentalists had not yet learned that they were capable of wrestling for political control, and they may not have really thought they needed political control. They were focused on gaining moral control. They still kind of had this idea that if everybody was good and moral, then they would naturally make the right political choices. So they didn't feel like they needed to control the government. They felt like they needed to control the moral center of each person. The fundamentalists at the time thought that they would turn the tide their way and save America from liberalism, socialism, and evolution with prayers and revival services. This was really ineffective. (laughs) I can't imagine that it would be effective. (laughs) But BJU struggled along. The end of World War II brought a financial boon for BJU and other small Christian colleges in the form of the GI Bill. At BJU, attendance more than doubled in the late 40s. BJU was actually founded as Bob Jones College. Uh, It didn't technically become Bob Jones University until 1947, but they moved in 1946 to their final home in Greenville, South Carolina. They built a brand new campus and they reopened officially as Bob Jones University in the fall of 1947. Strom Thurmond, the segregationist governor of South Carolina, as you may remember Ooh. from the John Todd episode, uh, sat on the board of Bob Jones University, and he spoke at the dedication of the new campus in 1947. Yeah, uh, this was oh, so that's like a year before he decides <laughs> to form his own political party. Right, and, right. Yeah, we'll talk about that in a little bit. Well, if you didn't like that, you're not going to like most of this next section because here's where the racism comes in. So there is unfortunately an abundance of connection between Bob Jones University and Bob Jones leadership and the KKK. Of course, at this point, Bob Jones University was an all-white college, all-white institution. It's not unusual at this point in history, but we'll get to that too. So one dorm on campus in Greenville it has now been renamed H.A. Ironside Dorm, but it was originally named Bib Graves after a man who was the, a founding member of the board of Bob Jones University. He was also a former Alabama governor. He was also a personal friend of Bob Jones Sr., And he was also at one point the Grand Cyclops of the Montgomery chapter of the KKK. Uh, Another connection to the KKK, John Temple Graves II was a prominent Southern newspaper columnist, columnist and frequent Bob Jones University convocation speaker. I tried to track down any record of John Temple Graves II's KKK membership. I didn't find anything off the bat. What I did find is a mountain of evidence of him being just ridiculously racist. Ooh, you want to hit us with some highlights? Or are they too like? Gross I can to I can give the... you one. I'm going to give a TW first because because of um racist acts of murder and violence. Oh no! Oh so, god! Beep beep beep! Uh, John Temple Graves the second was outspokenly pro lynching. He Ugh. said that basically in a world where white women get raped and the law doesn't do enough about it, the only way to preserve law and order is for white men to lynch people. Oh, so yeah, not great. Fuck this guy. Yeah, he is, uh, and he was speaking at religious services at Bob Jones University. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, oh, I have a, a few articles about him linked in the show notes. Um, 
or in the in the Patreon source post if you would like to learn more. I do want to add a point of clarity because I ran into a confusing moment in my research here. There was a guy named Bob Jones who was the Grand Dragon of the KKK, which is apparently the stupid name for the national leader of the KKK. This is not the same person as the founder of Bob Jones University. It's just a common name. It's a different guy. He's not a relative or anything. Just in case anybody digs further into this, <laughs> want to help them not make the confusing mistake that I made. It's Bob Jones University. So, no black so we talked, people. Super we racist. Really, really, really dislike and hate people yeah. of color and especially black people. Okay. Ew. So we talked earlier about how fundamentalism was originally more of an umbrella term that encompassed people from multiple Christian denominations. This is why BJU was and is still considered non-denominational, because to the original fundamentalists, denomination didn't matter if you could agree with what they called the fundamentals. When we're talking about this time period, the 40s and 50s, fundamentalism was still relatively apolitical, at least compared to today's fundamentalism. The shift into politics is beginning, but compared to what we see now, it's almost nothing. Fundamentalists generally supported segregation and opposed integration. And as the national political climates shifted toward looking at the issue of integration, especially in schools, fundamentalists became very concerned and much more politically involved. We've talked before about the religious motivations for institutionalized racism, and there couldn't be a clearer example of those beliefs in practice than in the history of BJU. While private schools were being founded all over the South as a workaround for impending school integration, Bob Jones University was already a segregated institution and had been formally on paper since its inception. Of course, you'll remember the pro-segregation pamphlet written around this time by up-and-coming fundamentalist IFB leader John R. Rice, who outlined his religious thoughts on segregation. John R. Rice is coming back in a less racist way, which is nice, I guess. I'm sure that a lot of our listeners are very aware of Brown versus the Board of Education. It's the landmark Supreme Court case from 1954. There had been several previous court cases challenging the current state of segregated private schools or segregated public schools. But the one that made it to the Supreme Court was Brown versus the Board of Education. In this case, a father challenged the segregated school system, arguing that separate but equal was not able to be applied to his daughter's school because her all-black elementary school was not equal to the all-white elementary schools in their area. The Supreme Court ruled in his favor, and the result of this court case is that the process of integrating American schools began. Only public schools were subject to Brown versus the Board of Education. So private schools became much more popular all of a sudden for racist reasons. Mm. All over the country, but concentrated in the South, private schools began to pop up because private schools could discriminate based on race where public schools could not. I am linking a full article for more of the history of this and how it unexpectedly for me ties into Roe v. Wade and other things. But one statistic from this article, and this is from... Hold on, let me make sure I'm citing the right thing. So this is from the Politico article. The title is The Real Origins of the Religious Right. And here, okay, so here's here's the, uh, the statistic. Holmes County, Mississippi schools were officially desegregated in 1969. And it took them 15 years after Brown versus the Board of Education, because of course it did. Throughout the mid-60s and up until 1969, private white-only schools were being founded in Holmes County, Mississippi, in response to desegregation. Quoting from the Politico article, In 1969, the first year of desegregation, the number of white students enrolled in public schools in Holmes County dropped from 771 to 28. The following year, that number fell to zero. Mm. Yeah. Um, I was very aware of the fact that this is how private schools and also Christian private schools came into existence and gained popularity in the South. That statistic still just absolutely floored me. 
because you went to a private Christian school, but you had it was you had black people at your school. So the private school that I went to was an IFB private school, and it was founded significantly after the 50s and 60s. I'm not sure when it was founded. I think it was probably in the late 80s or early 90s, um, but it could have been even a little bit later than that. So the school that I went to wasn't founded necessarily to get around integration. And we had a fairly diverse student body, especially um, considering the area that we lived in. I feel like our student body reflected the demographics of the area pretty well. My private school would have been founded to get around the teachings of atheism and evolution. So it's a slightly different thing when you're talking about like ACE, Abeka, specifically IFB private schools. But I think the the statistic of white enrollment in Holmes County, Mississippi dropping in two years from 771 students to zero speaks for itself. That really floored me. That just emotionally drained me when I read that st- statistic. And I think that was, it was so impactful for me that I wanted to make sure I included it for our listeners. I want you to keep in mind this shift to private schooling because private schools were exempt from desegregation and integration. This is going to be important again in just a couple minutes after the offering break. So as we move into the 1960s, the history of Bob Jones University, remember one of the things that the fundamentals, the essay series, the fundamentals were against in the very beginning of the American fundamentalist movement was the quote unquote social gospel. They were anti-union, anti-welfare for racist reasons that they barely hid within religious reasons, and explicitly pro-capitalist. I have to wonder if this is where a little bit of the fundamentalist hatred of Catholics comes in, because this is right around the time in history where a Catholic pope, and I think it was Pope Leo, made an explicit pro-union statement. I mean, Catholics were generally on the side of organized labor, because when you think about who like, who the Catholics were in the country at that time, the Irish Time. and the Italians. Irish, yeah. Italians, Polish, um, living in like the north, living in um, living in know, factory towns and slaughterhouse towns. Yeah, and th- and that's basically who it was. It was it, those are the people who were you know involved in organized labor. Irish, Italians, uh, Polish. So that yeah, so that totally, and it was high, heavily Catholic groups of people. So it makes total sense that the Pope is coming down uh, pro-union and pro-workers' rights, and the Catholic Church was seen as a more liberal Christian organization at the time. So I think maybe that's where some of the fundamentalist hatred of Catholics comes in, because the fundamentalists were explicitly against all of those things and pro-capitalist. So as we get into the 1960s, fundamentalism is steadily becoming more politically active. I think it can appear when we when we look at this in retrospect, a lot of people ask me questions like, why did fundamentalism suddenly become politically active in the 60s and 70s? And it looks like a sudden change. I hope I've illustrated how it wasn't a sudden change. It just suddenly became more apparent in contrast to the culture and how that kind of played out over time. So, Gavi, I was wondering if you could take over for a minute and fill us in on the Southern strategy. This is something I know you're really well versed on because we've talked about it off mic. And if you could fill us in on what's going on politically, I think I can tie this all in together with what's going on in the religious realm. So we're talking mainly about the time between like Reconstruction and like 1980. So uh, as like as we know, and as the Republican Party loves to remind us of uh, the Civil War, or I guess as Sadie calls it, the War of Northern Aggression. Uh, I the don't. Dem- I do not. <laughs> no, she she absolutely doesn't. That's just a, a Alabama joke. Older members uh, of my family do. <laughs> I do not. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah. So during this time, like in the Civil War. Republicans were, uh, uh, were were more on the side of, of abolition, and the Democrats were pro states' rights or slavery, uh, as as we tend to call it. All the, there's more nuance in there, but this is the simplified version. And this basically continues through the end of of Reconstruction, where the Democrats are basically the party for white people. The Republicans 
are the party. They're more on the side of they're on the side of like corporate interests. They're also on the side of um, it, but but they're they're more closely associated with like black people aren't voting Democrat. Black people are voting Republican um, during this time. Those that that can, can vote, yeah, yeah. Those those that are in states that uh, allow them to vote, uh, which mainly the southern states weren't the ones that were letting them vote because of. Te- tests that you had to take in order, like literacy tests that you had to take in order to vote and other forms of voter suppression. Yeah. And Jim Crow. And Sorry, even that's something you- I've been looking into really heavily lately. And I just had to say that part. Yeah. And even if you like, I mean, they'd make it legal, but even if like technically legal, but even if you passed, like if you jumped through all the hoops and you got through all of their things that you had to like do to get it to to get the vote they'd still beat it out of you or they'd murder you if you tried to vote so right if there was even a polling place that was physically accessible for you to reach by foot or yeah other form of transportation it was basically them being like well we didn't technically make it illegal we just made it impossible so yeah uh, just like how just exactly like how integrating schools meant that, te- oh, technically you can go to any public school, but all of our white children are now going to private schools. So yeah. it's still segregated schools for another, I don't know, 20 years. <laughs> anyway, th- this changes with the Great Depression because in the Great Depression, everyone's broke. There's no work, can't afford food. It's rich people don't care about you. There's more of a realignment of black voters to the Democratic Party, at least in the northern states, because that's the the states where black people can actually vote. Sometimes because, you know, basically there is the Democrats are promising a stronger social safety net. Uh, Roosevelt's promising a stronger uh, social safety net. So following the Second World War, there is a sense among Southern Democrats within their party that the tide is turning like within their party against segregation. So Harry Truman is the president at the time. And he's proposing civil rights legislation. He's like in 1948 going up into the the election. He's proposing we want to do civil rights legislation. He's making this proposition to Congress and he's saying this at the NAACP convention, which is wild to think about because like 30, 40 years previously, uh, like a Democrat president speaking at the NAACP convention would have been just like bonkers i don't even this seems like, like a not, political game of musical chairs as a response to this strom thurmond uh who uh, we talked about earlier but he was a democrat he was the governor of south carolina basically decides to form his own party uh kind of as like a spoiler candidate for the democrats you know because because truman's the incumbent truman is coming off of the back of the the victory in the second world war truman Truman. also took office after the death of a really beloved president yeah which is the johnson effect just previous to johnson right and and so truman is like speaking as far as who is going to get the most votes everybody knows that truman is going to get the most votes but basically strom thurmond decides okay, I'm going to form my own breakoff party, run as a spoiler candidate in the Democratic Party, and you, uh, th- the Southern Democrats are all going to vote for me and not you. And because they're going to vote for me and not you, I'm going to split the vote enough that you're going to lose the election and the Republicans are, are, are going to get in charge. So he's, he, he calls this party the Dixie Crap Party. And he's basically saying, you need to cut this civil rights shit out or you're never going to win another election election happens uh thurman actually wins like a million votes and he wins four states he won louisiana mississippi alabama and south carolina however truman was popular enough that this just it didn't matter that he had enough uh that he won enough states that he he won the election anyway and this is also why the the whole dewey defeats truman thing happened was because there was question about um what states who was going to win and 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 all of that because uh the whole strom thurman thing totally threw a wrench into the into the works so you have this shift that's starting in like the late 20s early 30s and it's coming to to like to a head in 1948 but it doesn't really get fully realized until 1964 because in the 50s we'd had brown versus the board of education the 
kind of like the segregationists sort of saw a lot of the writing on the wall. But 1964, Civil Rights Act passes. Strom Thurmond, who has since become a U.S. senator from South Carolina, then announces uh, prior to the 64 election that he is switching parties from the Democratic Party to the Republican Party because he feels that he no longer has a place in the Democratic Party because he is a segregationist and he's super racist. And Thurman, I think, was the most prominent segregationist in the Senate at this time. And so this move is basically a signal that he's making to all of the other segregationists to say, basically, you, you need to switch parties. And, and a lot of them did. And I think the switch was also compounded in 1973, when there's the Roe v. Wade decision, and it's that legalizes abortion nationwide, and many evangelical conservatives who weren't really as they, they weren't like the fundamentalist type conservatives, but they were evangelicals. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. and, and so they weren't going to be hardcore pro segregation, but they and they also kind of saw politics as dirty and they sat on the sidelines for a bit. They then basically the Roe v. Wade thing happens and they realize, OK, abortion is legal nationwide. This this is um, untenable for us. And they get involved under the banner of the Republican Party. And the reason this didn't happen earlier is that abortion was seen as a Catholic issue. And not something that Protestants were really concerned about uh, up into the late 1960s. And in the late in the late 1960s, this shifted and the Southern Baptist Convention got super involved with the abortion issue and other conservative Protestants suddenly started to see this as a them problem, not a Catholic problem. And this was a. Uh, I think Jerry Falwell was heavily involved in that. Maybe this is more true now than it was then, but I know that there's a lot of Catholics, yourself included, who will say, well, this is something that Catholic doctrine says that the, the church technically says, but when it comes to how I'm voting and who I'm supporting, this isn't going, I'm not going to, I'm, I'm actually disagreeing with the church and I'm going the other way on it. Yeah, I, I disagree with the church on, on a lot of social issues. Um, I'm there for the theology, not the social issues. I don't see how those things have really much to do with theology and, uh, my religious beliefs have practically nothing to do with how I vote. Yeah. And I think that's maybe very somewhat true for a lot of Catholic voters today. I don't know how true it was back then, but that, that's also sort of the way that a lot of this But the goes Catholic Church well. at the time was also extremely socially liberal. The only big issue that they would fall on the conservative side on was abortion. And that hadn't become the single issue voter single issue. That was still in the process of happening. Um, if you listen to Slow Burn, they did an uh, excellent series. They interviewed the daughter of the Catholic couple who more or less started the Right to Life movement. It is really, really wow. fascinating. That does sound fascinating. I'll have to check that out. Um, but basically, at this time, in, you've got sort of a joining of evangelical Protestants uh, reactionaries, people who are who are angry about uh, uh, the social changes going through the country, either, you know, be it like the civil rights movement or the women's lib movement or the beginning of the LGBTQ rights movement. Um, you've got anti-communists, you've got racists, you've got big business, um, all of these people kind of under the same banner. And they so basically what the what the Republicans have gone and done is found Every special interest who is easily pleased by action on a single issue and does not give two f about anything else. And then they pander to all of them individually. And that's kind of been their playbook for the last 50 years, except for since I don't know when, but at some point that kind of turned into its own sort of fundamentalism thing where you either believe all of these things or you like there's no big tentiness it's very much like okay you believe all of these like the, the 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 party line is you have to believe all of these things in order to get elected mm -hmm. now and i i think that the idea that this was happening politically and it wasn't just happening religiously is a really important idea to get in your head 
Yeah. Because now oh. I think it's so easy to look and say, all, all, all of these are religious, moral de- decisions. and But I don't think that was strictly how it was seen by people at the time. So Bob Jones University, at this moment in history, kind of moving through the 60s into the early 70s, was the biggest and best known fundamentalist Christian college in the country. And political involvement was nothing new to them. Hiles Anderson and Pensacola Christian College and Liberty were not even founded for most of the time period we're start we're talking about. They all got their starts in the early 70s. It's obvious why the anti-abortion people and the anti-gay rights people and the anti-women's rights people want to all be under the same banner because they all have the same motivations. But the fundamentalist rejection of the social gospel and their embrace of capitalism, I think, is crucial to understanding why the racists and the anti-communists and the big business people also fit under that same banner. And because, like I said, other big name fundamentalist universities didn't exist yet, Bob Jones University was the de facto center of American fundamentalism at the time. This is before Jack Hiles got the plaque for having the world world's largest Sunday school. Uh, this is before ultra-fundamentalist universities, or <laughs> universities, ultra-fundamentalist brainwashing camps like Hiles Anderson were founded. Republican politicians began a long tradition of visiting and speaking at Bob Jones University. It was almost a rite of passage thing that they had to do to court all of those millions and millions of sweet, sweet evangelical votes that they needed. This came back to bite Bush in the ass in a major way, but we're going to get to that. So before we do, I think we need to go take up the offering. Sounds great. Let's do it. Now a word from our sponsor, BetterHelp. As a full-time parent and content creator, the small problems can really add up. Sometimes I'm dealing with a spilled cup of milk. Sometimes a deadline is coming up too quickly. Maybe I'm behind on laundry, or maybe I have to make a business decision that I don't quite feel prepared for. And sometimes these things all happen on the same day, and it's hard to stay in problem-solving mode. I've had to learn to find and make my own solutions for my unique problems so that I can solve them effectively and get on with my busy day. Therapy can help you become a better problem solver so that you can go into situations in problem solving mode and stay on track for your personal goals. I started therapy when I was leaving a cult and trying to unbrainwash myself, but I've continued going to therapy during difficult transition periods in my life. For me, therapy is an outlet for processing the trauma that I've experienced, but it's also a place where I can talk through solutions for the smaller things that frustrate me on a daily basis. So it helps me move past the big roadblocks in my life like trauma and brainwashing, but it also helps me get past the little bumps in the road like spilled milk and episode deadlines. If you're thinking of trying therapy, especially if you're a busy person like me, BetterHelp is a great option. It's completely online, so not only do you not have to leave your house to go to therapy, You can choose video chats, phone conversations, or even just a live chat so you don't have to see anyone on screen at all. You just fill out a survey to get matched with a therapist, and if at any point your provider isn't the best fit, you can switch anytime. When you want to be a better problem solver, therapy can get you there. Visit BetterHelp.com slash Eden today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp.com slash Eden. Hey, Sadie here. If this is your first time listening to the Leaving Eden podcast, make sure you go back and check out episode 57. It's a primer episode for new listeners. That episode tells my personal story and gives you all the terms and information that you'll need to know going forward. Also, check out our cult true crime series, The First Family of Fundamentalism, so that you can get the whole cult story. If you like our show, you can support us by joining our Patreon, where we have extended and uncensored episodes, as well as other bonus content available. You can also join in the discussion in our Facebook group, That group is called Eden Exodus. Tell a friend, tell a family member, tell your worst enemy. The Leaving Eden podcast is a fully independent podcast, and we really appreciate your support. Now, back to the show. We are back from our break. We are talking about Bob Jones University. So, how does BJU 
uh, which is, I guess, the cultural core of this really reactionary brand of, of uh, uh, evangelical conservative uh, conservatism. Um, how does BJU react to culture becoming more open? Are they going hard against the flow or does BJU maybe have to like swallow their pride a little bit? So I mentioned earlier in the episode that private schools were exempt from Brown versus Board of Education and that that included BJU. So while culture was changing rapidly, not only were BJU holding on to these strict standards and strict rules and kind of still on campus pretending like it's still the 40s and 50s, they were also able to still only admit white students. So what was what's their reasoning for this? Because the fundamentalists that I know and like I know of, they're willing to share the gospel of Jesus with everybody and anybody who will listen. Do they think that black students shouldn't get to learn about Jesus or are they just wor- more worried that they don't want to uh, like upset their clientele? So it doesn't have anything to do with um, upsetting the families who were sending their children there, I don't think. And of course, they uh, supported evangelizing and giving the gospel to people of any race, but they were just classic segregationists. So the school board, including Bob Jones Jr., who officially took over the reins of the school after Bob Jones Sr., the friend of Klansman, died in the 1960s, just simply believed that races should be separate. It wasn't that they had a religious belief that some people should get to own other people. It was that they had a religious belief that races should not interact. Also, okay, so one thing, Dr. Bob Jones Sr. famously had a quote, and his quote on segregation was something to the effect of, God made the races separate, and he did not mean for us to undo that. This is a Christian college. You go to Christian college to get married. And of course, Through religious beliefs like the curse of Ham and many, many related beliefs that spin off of that, they believed that interracial marriage was sinful. God made us separate. We should not mix people together. It's going to end up like the Tower of Babel again. Okay, so they're afraid that black students are going to go to their university and that they're going to. uh, Mm Oh, okay. So Mm. I was and I was hearing this. Ew. It is. It is. Ew. And I was hearing this growing up, though. I was hearing, um, you know, I went to school and church with people of different races. And what I was, I mean, my my church had Black pastors come to be the featured speaker for our conferences, were elevated just like a white IFB pastor would have been. The racism that I grew up with was so subtle that I did not realize it until I was an adult, which was a highly unpleasant experience. Um, I am thankful. Oh, I, for, I am thankful for it. I had this experience where I realized the racism that had the very subtle, at least to me, because my church would say things like, oh, we believe everybody is equal and we believe men and women are equal before God. They just have different roles. And you see where this is going as far as race goes. Yeah. But I was hearing this exact same thing about interracial marriage being a sin because God made races separate and did not want us to mix it. That's going against God's design. So in 1970, this whole Brown versus the Board of Education thing drags on for 15 years. And in 1970, the IRS finally stepped in to save the day and made it known that any private school using racially discriminatory admissions practices would be subject to losing their tax exempt status. Good. Yes, good. So in 1971, the IRS officially revoked BJU's tax exempt status. And said that they would owe a million dollars in back taxes. A million bucks. A million dollars. Man, couldn't have happened to a nicer guy. <laughs> it could have. I know a lot of nicer guys. And remember when, when Pensacola had to pay taxes, it was like 30-something million. So I guess BJU got off pretty easy. Pensacola was years and years and years of tax evasion. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. So Bob Jones University was finally forced to admit non-white students. At first, they only admitted black students who were already married, quote, within their race. And then in 1975, Mm. yeah, because that way you can't marry any of our good white kids. I can't. It's so gross. It's Uh, incredibly gross. Mm. Um, 
<laughs> I'm like trying not to think about it too deeply because the rage. Yeah. So then in 1975, BJU finally admitted unmarried Black students. The university, under the leadership of Bob Jones Jr., sued the IRS in a multi decade court case claiming that segregation was a sincerely held religious belief. This case eventually went all the way to the Supreme Court. While the case was ongoing, Bob Jones University implemented a new, unfortunately legal, discriminatory practice. They did not allow interracial dating. And now you can put a pin in that one as well, because this will also all come back in a few decades here. Okay, well, we have to come back to that. We will. Believe me, I've got it all planned out. We're going to sew this all up. Yikes. So by the time this court case got all the way to the Supreme Court, it was initiated in, um, I think, in 1971 or shortly thereafter. But by the time it got all the way to the Supreme Court, Reagan was president. Reagan originally asked the IRS to drop the case against BJU, and he got a <sighs> ton of backlash for that. So he reversed that request. When people are like, oh, Ronald Reagan wasn't racist, like... <laughs> yeah, no. Um, oh, man. Oh, so man. You, <laughs> BJU lost oh. their Supreme Court case. Uh, the vote was eight justices to one, Yeah, I, which like, is pretty honestly, bad. I just I can't imagine that a lot of non-white students were jumping out of their seats to go to BJU anyway, though. OK, sure. But just because only a small number of people want something doesn't mean that it's okay for it not to be their right to have that thing. I don't have the experience of not being a white person, so I'm kind of guessing based on my own experiences that I do have. I do have the experience of being an AFAB person in a highly misogynist world, and I know that I wanted something. I wanted to go to Hiles Anderson, and I was willing to accept all of the misogyny that going to Hiles Anderson would entail because going to Hiles Anderson was my goal. And I still found some amount of self-determination in following my goal, even though the institution was taking much of that self-determination away from me with their misogynistic practices. I imagine it might be similar for a person of color who wanted to attend BJU. And I guess like if you're just existing in a world that is really <clears throat> discriminatory toward you, you like you you just kind of accepted a certain amount of that just going forward no matter what. Right. And hopefully it's, you know, until this gets better, there Mm. are things that have to be accepted. Just as a side note, the 2020 statistics for BJU were that 78% of students were white, representing 2,142 students, and 2% were black, representing 63 students in 2020. Well, that tells me what I expect. That's like... But just because not a lot of people want the right to do something doesn't mean that you can take the right away. So as we move into the 1970s, there was a resurgence, not just of the fundamentalist movement, but of the IFB movement. So this is where we get into the further splintering of fundamentalism. This is fundamentalist drama, and I kind of love it. (laughs) Oh, God, what happens here? (laughs) So at first, fundamentalism was not a monolith. It was a collection of people with differing beliefs who found a set of things that they agreed on and they felt like they agreed on all of the most important things. The doctrine of secondary separation is what split Bob Jones University from televangelist types like Billy Graham and Jerry Falwell on one side and the ultra fundies like Jack Hiles and John R. Rice on the other side. We have talked about secondary separation on the show before. I just don't think I used the correct term and we didn't go any deeper into what it means, but you're going to remember this. So primary separation, as in a (coughs) sold out, separated, soul winning church, means that a person or church or group separates themselves from the secular world. The rules of fundamentalism have a lot to do with separation. Not only do the fundamentalists of today believe, for example, that it is a sin for women to wear pants, but they also believe that a Christian person should be visually distinct from anyone else. So a lot of the clothing rules, the not going to movies, even walking down the aisle at the beer store, all of that is secondary separation. So the main reason that fundies don't believe, let's just pick one, the main reason that fundies don't believe you should see movies is because there could be something sinful in there. But the second reason that they believe that is that somebody might see you going to the movie theater and think you're going to see something similar or something sinful. We've talked about that, right? Yeah. So that has to do with secondary separation. Like, not looking or acting like the world. 
being different on purpose, being a peculiar people. So secondary separation also refers to separating oneself from other fundamentalist Christians who are not separated enough from the world. So not only am I separating myself from the world, I'm separating myself from people who are not separating themselves far enough from the world. So this is like the the really, really, really culty stuff. Yeah. And this is the reason you've heard me talk about like real fundies wouldn't follow Brittany Dawn or Paul and Morgan or the girl to find people on Instagram. Right. They're too trendy. They are too much like the world. And therefore, the real fundamentalists separate themselves from them. So you've brought up the feud between uh, Jack Hiles and uh, 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 BJ in the past. So is this where it's all like going to come to a head? Yes. So pre, this is the fundy drama. Oh, I love fundy drama. So pre-1972, <laughs> Jack Hiles, John R. Rice, Bob Jones Jr. were all associated with each other. They preached at each other's churches and conferences and colleges. They wrote nice things about each other in their respective newspapers and publications and this, that, and the other. And then it fell apart. <laughs> So this Ugh. secondary, they had a they had a, a friend breakup. What what are they calling it when a bro breakup? Isn't there a new like trendy term for that? I don't know. I'm not on TikTok. I have I, somebody's going to tell me. Secondary <laughs> separation. The way that it all shook out, it kind of worked in a tier system, with BJU falling in the middle, Hiles Anderson being at the strictest, and then Jerry Falwell, that type of like Billy Graham televangelist, falling at the least strict end of the spectrum. In the 1950s, Bob Jones University, under the leadership of Bob Jones Sr., were already starting to separate themselves from these televangelist types because they were too ecumenical. In fundy jargon, they were neo-evangelical. They were associating with less orthodox Christians and the cardinal sin, no pun intended, associating with Catholics. So Bob Ooh. Jones Sr. first separated himself and BJU from Billy Graham because Billy Graham had Christians who believed in higher criticism on his board of directors for his ministry. Oh, you can't have that. Right. So it's not separate. So Billy Graham didn't believe in higher criticism necessarily, but he associated with people who did. So Bob Jones Sr. had to separate from him. Interesting. And then later on, <laughs> this is where it gets hilarious. Okay. <laughs> God. Later on, Bob Jones Jr. got in a massive feud with John R. Rice because John R. Rice still associated with Billy Graham. So Bob Jones Jr. is oh. mad at John R. Rice because John R. Rice associates with someone who associates with Catholics and people who believe in higher criticism. Yo, this is like some rap beef. It is. Like, like this is like. Because oh. John R. Rice. You did a song with this guy even after he did a diss track about me? Like, what are you, like... <laughs> so, <laughs> because uh, John R. Rice and these evil Catholics and higher criticism believers might hypothetically end up at a non-alcoholic dinner party at some point at Billy Graham's house, Bob Jones Jr. is breaking what was described as a father-son relationship with John R. Rice. What? And then they also had like a minor quibble on biblical inspiration. The same thing that a bunch of people fought Scop over in the early 2000s. We'll get into that when we actually talk about biblical inspiration. So Bob Jones Jr. and Bob Jones University of the 70s and 80s were already separated and continued to separate from these televangelist, big seminar, arena filling, on TV types of evangelists. Then <laughs> this is where it becomes a circle. <laughs> so. Jack Hiles, the Hiles camp, and the mainstream IFB type separated from Bob Jones Jr. and BJU because they thought that Bob Jones Jr. and BJU were also too liberal. So now you see the tier system. Uh. Hiles is separated from Jones. Jones is separated from Falwell. But Jack Hiles and John R. Rice are still friends, even though John R. Rice previously associated with Bob Jones and currently associates with Jerry Falwell. <laughs> So, or Billy Graham. So then you haven't even heard what happens. Next. Like, 
oh god what what happens does uh somebody get poisoned at their own wedding and uh no but they write a lot of really mean letters about each other <laughs> so then jack hiles and john r rice had a falling out because jack hiles was hard line king james version only and john r rice sat on the board of translators for a different bible translation wait 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 what yeah so- John R. Rice was like briefly not KJVO and then maybe went back. I can't remember. Uh, God. But John R. Rice also, like, he also walked back his segregation pamphlet, but kept the misogyny. John R. Rice was a bit of a floater. He was interesting. So that, okay, that. So there is like, there is a whole bunch more. There are like verbal duels in Baptist and Christian newspapers and pamphlets. These people were writing pamphlets about how much they hated each other. It was some real Hamilton and Burr. So it's like uh, distracts. They're sending distracts yes. back and forth. Like um, I, I want to put. I'm gonna. We should read one of those. It, like, can we read one of those uh, over like the ether beat or like? I the, mean, the, yeah. If I can, I, I, we we might be able to 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 drop that in here. Um, okay. John R. Rice owned, or John R. Rice was like heavily associated with the Sword of the Lord, which is a news. A, a, baptist newspaper weren't they the one that published the the jack scop uh no the jack hiles the uh, story, no newspaper. that was the biblical evangelist but the guy who wrote that for the biblical evangelist formerly worked for the sword of the lord and jack hiles accused him of only writing the hit piece about him in the biblical evangelist because he was jealous that he didn't get the new leader of the sword of the lord position what you need to know is that secondary separation makes you separate from the people who aren't separated enough uh, Bob Jones Jr. thought that Falwell and Graham and Televangelist were liberal, but Hiles thought that Jones and BJU were liberal. That's about it. I just find the Fundy <laughs> drama fascinating. This is hilarious, man. These people are like, you sometimes get people on Twitter who are like, you must believe XYZ hateful thing because you follow this person who follows this person on Twitter who said this thing in a tweet once. You, you know what I'm saying? That is because people do the same things that people do humans are kind of predictable yeah it's just like getting tribal and deciding that they're going to fight each other rather than yep so the feuding over who is a liberal the supreme court case over integration these things were a cloud over bju from the 70s all the way into the 90s it seems like at some point there was a truce between bju and the sword of the lord john r rice camp because the sword of the lord conference was held at bju in 1987 so there must have been some kind of kiss and makeup, if not fully, at least partially. In the meantime, BJU published a curriculum for Christian schools and homeschooling. And then later in the 90s, they launched distance learning classes, both of which I'm sure many of our listeners have experience with. So how's attendance going during oh, all at the like, college? Is, yeah. Is, is it being negatively affected by all these feuds and all these court cases and everything? I was not able to find any attendance data further back than 10 years ago. The only thing I could find is that the current college president now, recently in the last couple of years, cited their best years ever as having between 4,500 and 5,000 students. Current numbers say that they have about 2,600 students now. So I can tell you it's declined now from the peak, but I don't know when that peak was. Yeah, and everywhere has declined. <laughs> like a, 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 yeah. every private uh, uh, mm-hmm. college has has declined um, over right. the past ten years. Yeah. So I don't have the stats knowledge to try to tease that out any further. So let's move. That was the seventies and the eighties. Let's kind of move into the nineties and two thousands. Things that happened in our lifetime because this is when we get to go back to Bush. <laughs> oh God, that guy. <laughs> so we've talked before about how fundamentalism saw this huge resurgence in the 1970s and 1980s. Uh, It's when a lot of Bible colleges were opened. It's when First Baptist Church of Hammond was at its peak. The satanic panic reached new heights. Ronald Reagan was president. And as we've discussed, in the 1990s, fundamentalism began to wane again, maybe going back into hibernation the way that it was in the 20s and 30s in an article I referenced earlier. Church membership and Bible college attendance numbers begin to slump. The way that I see it, and this is just my personal take, fundamentalism attracted a lot of people in those peak years in the 70s and 80s. It attracted thousands and thousands and thousands of people, but then it went stagnant. Uh, John R. Rice died. Lester Roloff died. 20 years after that, Jack Hiles died. 
these heroes of fundamentalism started dying and churches stopped growing, whether they hit 500 and stopped growing or like First Baptist Church of Hammond hit 20,000 and stopped growing, maybe you can only just put so many people into the same room. Or maybe parents weren't as willing to send their kids on buses. Maybe the scandals of the 80s and fundamentalism, the scandals of the 80s and 90s from the Jack Hiles Jenny Nistrick scandal to financial misdealings, the A.V. Ballinger scandal, scandals at Hiles Anderson College, all of that. Maybe that had an effect. I don't really know what did it. Those were all really publicized. And if you were in, in this, <laughs> you, you'd have heard about them. Well, even if you if you were a resident of Hammond, Indiana, this some of this stuff would have been on your front on the front page of your newspaper. Jack Hiles went on actual television, yeah, to talk about the Nistrick scandal. And you would all know the church because they're the ones that are fucking sending everybody around on buses and knocking on your door every Saturday, and you're like, and you go, oh, yeah. those are the same people as their deacon board member is on trial right now. Oh, I don't want anything to do with that. So somehow, and I don't know what combination of people becoming less trusting, the natural ebb and flow of fundamentalism, the scandals, the rise of the mega church. I think all of those things had an impact, but the IFB movement quit growing. The massive growth that they had seen during the 70s and 80s just kind of leveled out. And in my opinion, the people that they captured back then in the 70s and 80s are pretty much the people they have now. They have those people that haven't left yet, their kids and their grandkids. And that's kind of it. Which is maybe why the have a bunch of kids thing has become popular. I don't know. So yeah. as fundamentalism, it's my opinion that they've gotten everybody they're going to get and they're just kind of living off royalty checks in the form of children and grandchildren. It's not my opinion that fundamentalism leveled out numerically. And as that happened, it seemed that BJU kind of just kept doing what they had always been doing. They were conveniently placed from a marketing standpoint as a less extreme alternative to Hiles Anderson College. Because they were less, less extreme, they were more palatable to mainstream evangelicals, people who were not a part of the IFB movement. So you told me that you really wanted to go to Hiles Anderson, even though your parents tried to dissuade you from doing it because they knew how extreme it was. Would BJU have been a better option? Like if you'd have said... I want to go to BJU. I think my parents would have allowed me to go to BJU, but I would not have accepted it as an option for myself as a teenager. I heard so much about BJU from the pulpit. Like I'd be at a youth conference and TW, I'm going to do my fundy preacher impression for a, a very short amount of time. Uh, but you'd hear something like, well, if you want to be a liberal, if you want to backslide, if you want to go soft, if you want to be accepting, if you want to put lace on your underwear, will you go ahead and go to some li li lily livered yellow bellied school like BJU? But if you want to be sold out, if you want to do God's will, if you want to be a real fundamentalist, if you really want to serve God, if you're serious about the power of the Holy Spirit in your life, come to Hiles Anderson. So there was very much the impression that BJU was not for real fundamentalists. Mm. Even though BJU, of course, identifies as a fundamentalist school and still holds to the original fundamentals like that were written in the essay series. So BJU is maybe an option if you were not called to preach, if you never broke down and went to the altar and got called to preach during those high-pressure situations at Jesus Camp, and you just really wanted to be like a Christian vet tech or something, you could go to BJU. But it wasn't for mm. IFB kids who were called to the ministry. And it wasn't for IFB kids really at all, at least not my camp of the IFB. Yeah. OK, so Hiles Anderson fundies, they wouldn't. But I guess BJ, you wouldn't have been targeting them anyway, because like they're like. So that's the thing. BJ, you didn't really target anybody in particular. They cast a very wide net. Hiles Anderson is like a laser focus on who they want to come to college there. It is a Bible college. It is only for training people to go into the ministry in the IFB only. Hiles Anderson has only recently opened up a tiny bit to include a graphic design major. And that is only because IFB churches need graphic designers on staff now because the internet. BJU, on the other hand, it's a liberal arts school. They cast a wide net attracting 
people from IFB homeschool, ATI homeschoolers, all the way up to like fairly conservative Southern Baptists who don't mind living under pretty strict rules to go to Christian college. They, so Hiles Anderson is only for a tiny set subset of fundamentalists. Bob Jones University is for a much wider group. Liz attended BJU and Liz was raised even a hair more fundy than I was, but BJU is also marketing to people like the girl to find women's younger siblings. Right. Okay. Yeah. Because Liz went to BJU, but she wouldn't have gone near Hiles Anderson. Okay. Yes. But that's because Liz is smart, not because Liz wasn't raised fundamentalist. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) They're just smarter than me. (laughs) Yeah. So because BJU represents such a wider swath of Christian fundamentalism, conservative Christianity... And because they're so much more polished and polite about how extreme they are, you know, they say it the right way. They say it in a way that sounds so much nicer. And they have good diction and vocal training and a music program. Have you heard about our music program? They continue to be a practically mandatory campaign stop for Republican politicians to court evangelical votes. So like who who's going to BJU? Well, famously, like uh, George Bush made a visit on the presidential primary campaign trail in early 2000, which caused Mm. a heck of a controversy when the media found out that a current Republican presidential candidate visited a school where interracial dating was still banned in the year 2000. Wow. Yep. So this is from the Washington Post article from February 28th of 2000. The title of the article is Bush Cites Regret on Bob Jones. Uh, And I took quite a few little pieces from this article, but um, you can read the whole thing. So George Bush spoke at Bob Jones University. The McCain campaign found out about it and we're like, great, we got dirt on this guy. Let's do it, do it. They criticized him for speaking at a place with racist policies, but they also criticized Bob Jones, Bob Jones University's extreme anti-Catholic stance. Bob Jones University mm. hates Catholics, y'all. So McCain, of course, blew this up, made a huge deal out of it because he was thinking, oh, maybe I'll be the pro-Catholic candidate in this primary election and I'll get all those Republican Catholic votes. Right, because he's also from Arizona. Right. Large Catholic population in Arizona. Oh, is there? I didn't know that. Well, yeah, because there's a lot of Mexican-Americans that live there. Oh, right. Okay. So McCain wanted to be the the pro-Catholic candidate, and he had an easy way to blame Bush for being the anti-Catholic candidate. So Bush had to apologize and write ca- write letters to like Catholic bishops in several states, uh, asserting that he has never hated Catholics. And uh, oh, yeah, and I'm also sorry about <laughs> supporting a racist in- institution, too. But as usual with um, white people, the anti-Catholic sentiment got him in more trouble than the racist one did, which is unfortunate. This whole debacle ended a month later when Bob Jones III went on Larry King Live to sort it out on live national television. I do have to say that's the second time that Larry King has come up this year, and that is two more times than I expected him to come up on our podcast this year. When did Larry King come up before? Were we talking about... uh, Branch Davidians. Branch... Oh, that's right. Mm -hmm. That's right. Or FLDS. It was FLDS. Larry Bob Jones King. III went on Larry King. The whole transcript of his interview is linked in my sources post. Do recommend that you read it. It is fascinating the way that he he was uh Bob Jones the third was a smooth talker. He was good, uh really was able to downplay a lot of bullshit in that interview. But I've watched this, the interview. He was greasy. He this is man is so good. Greasy. At like downplaying horrible things that he did. But for the sake of time, focusing on the interracial dating role, I would read you the entire transcript if I could, but I do not have time. Bob Jones the third said, well, on this very day that I am here to interview for you, the rule had been dropped. So on March 3rd, 2000, the interracial dating rule was dropped. The reasoning he gave was extremely shady. Uh, Bob Jones III said, well, we don't think we're wrong. We still think that inter- interracial dating is a sin, but we don't want to cause offense. And clearly this is causing offense to the cause of Christ. And we don't want to do that. You can read the full quote on the mm. on the link. So when, when I was asking that really cynical question about were they doing it for real or for the clout? Why are they dropping it? That's the real question here. Okay. 
Okay. That's... They're dropping it because they because of social pressure, but they are talking about it in such a way that makes it seem like they're dropping it because they're so spiritual and love Jesus. Mm. Also, no apology for the anti-Catholic sentiment. In fact, BJ3 called Catholicism a cult in that same interview. To be clear, it's fine. The racism was infinitely more harmful and certainly hurt more people. So... People call Catholicism a cult all the time. Like, Yeah, like they're not correct. But uh, if you were going to insult me or insult people of color, I'd rather you insult me because that is less harmful. Really would be great if you didn't do either, but it's what it is. So in 2008, BJU finally made a formal apology for past racism. I want to quote Stephen Jones, son of BJ3, who was the president of the university at the time. For almost two centuries, American Christianity, including BJU in its early stages, was characterized by the segregationist ethos of American culture. Consequently, for far, for far too long, we allowed institutional policies regarding race to be shaped more directly by that ethos than by the principles and precepts of the scriptures. We conform to the culture rather than provide a clear Christian counterpoint to it. In so doing, we fail to accurately represent the Lord and to fulfill the commandment to love others as ourselves. For these fa failures, we are profoundly sorry. <sighs> Though no known antagonism toward minorities or expressions of racism on a personal level have ever been tolerated on our campus, mm. Mm, <laughs> we allowed institutional policies to remain in a pl to remain in place that were racially hurtful. Well, they had me in the first half. Right? Like, fuck they you, had, dude. <laughs> they, he was saying th this was part of American culture and we were part of it. We apologize. And we, we should, should have, have been it. better than that. We should have provided a clear Christian counterpoint to the culture, and which then, is a real apology. That's good. That's, that's great. a real if apology. There, that would have been fantastic. What, what was the second part? Was he like covering his ass in case they get sued? Like in case for like litigate? That's how so that what sounds he said is we have never <laughs> heard of a racist incident or experience expression on our campus ever i mean it's easy to say oh well no racists are on our campus like we don't have any racist incidents when your campus is like like when your campus integrated like, <laughs> true, <laughs> like, that's, true. i didn't true. think about that no but that's the thing is that like i was talking about or you were talking to me about like oh you haven't met people who are just like really open about the reason i'm like yeah i live in portland you know who lives in portland white people like i've yeah. lived in portland my whole like i mean i i went to a high school where it was like 30 percent black people but like you know for most of my life growing up here like you don't like most of the people that you meet like the mm -hmm. other people that you meet are white people so like the issues so, like, of race seen, just doesn't come up right like yeah. you've seen microaggressions and you've experienced microaggressions and like you have see you know seen a lot of people like say things that they didn't know were racist and then somebody corrects them and they then they double down and respond in an ugly and negative way like you've seen that kind of thing i'm sure yeah and the other thing that you see this is, this is the thing that you see a lot these days is white people having like conversations with each other about race and racism but like with only white people present and it gets really uncomfortable because everybody's kind of trying to outdo each other for how mm -hmm, anti-racist mm -hmm. you know what i'm saying like you've right. been there Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, like, you've seen stuff like that, which is still racist. It is the same thing as people who harm people based on race, but it is a different outcome, maybe a less harmful outcome, uh, even though those behaviors contribute to the things that do cause much bigger harm. Yeah. You don't know people who are, like, profoundly and deeply racist in every part of their lives. It is a part of who they are. I mean, I'm sure I've met them. I just, it just, just hasn't come know, up. Like, maybe. Yeah. yeah. So when BJU, when they're talking about dating, when they're talking about this uh, this interracial, are, are, are they defining dating in the same way as HAC defines it? Like, do you remember back uh, when we talked to listeners, if you remember back when we talked about the, the dating rules at HAC, any like one-on-one -on -one social interaction between male and female students that lasts longer than like 15 minutes counts as a date? Are they talking about it like that or is it like... I don't know what the specific rule was. I would imagine it's not the same as HAC. That 10-minute rule at HAC was only for Jericho Plan students, and it was only enforced for a couple of years. I don't have specifics. I would imagine that BJU probably had a much more conventional definition of dating. Are they keeping track of who's dating who like they do at HAC? And are they having like count, like uh, uh, 
uh, professors and advice and like faculty members trying to set students up with each other. So let me tell you what Bob Jones, thir- Bob Jones, the third said. So on Larry King, this is a quote. And if all anybody can see is this rule, which we never talk about or preach, which most of our students couldn't even tell you what it is, it is that unimportant to us. I said to our administration, you know, guys, this thing is of such insignificance to us. It is so significant to the world at large, the media particularly. Why should we have this here as an obstacle? It hurts our graduates. We love our graduates greatly. It hurts maybe the church as well. I don't want to hurt the Church of Jesus Christ. Mm, so that's, that's what Bob Jones claims. He claims that it was like basically not enforced. I do not buy that ever. I think if it was a rule, of course, there had to be some kind of enforcement. And it could have been by staff in like a written rule formal way where like people keep track on paper note cards of who is dating who. And like there's like a conspiracy theory string board and they keep an eye on it. Or it might have been enforced way more informally. Okay. Hiles Anderson had dress checks where we all had to get checked. Very in very formal ways. When I went to Pensacola Christian College, it was more like a staff member would walk up to you and be like, hey, you can't wear that top again, or hey, that skirt is too short, or whatever. And it was enforced very informally. So BJU could have been doing either one, but I do not buy that it was not enforced, that it was so insignificant that most students wouldn't know that it was a rule. I don't buy that. Because that's the thing that, like, if you were reading through the rule book and you saw that, you would say something about it to to the mm-hmm. other people that were yeah, so i don't know like this the way that bob jones the third is talking about this he's talking about getting rid of the ban on interracial dating in the same for like the same really cynical reason that the lds church got rid of polygamy oh yeah actually political expediency in the guise of a message from god good catch yeah So this political expediency and political involvement was finally walked back in 2005 before the apology for the racism happened. Stephen Jones uh, gave another interview in 2005 where he said, quote, the gospel is for individuals. The main message we have is to individuals. We are not here to save the culture. Man, I wish more Christians would take that to heart. I really do. I mean, they're still trying to save the culture. They're just a little more quiet about it now. But I do wish that more Christians would take that seriously. Absolutely. (laughs) Oh, man. So I I have to give people a heads up. This is where we are moving into the portion of our episode where we talk about sexual assaults. And the victim blaming here is absolutely disgusting. It is Bill Gothard level. It is awful, awful. Uh, I will try to continually TW before I say a a sentence that is awful. This is going to be rough and we're going to try to handle it as best as we can here. So... Before the dust had even settled from the dropping of the interracial dating rule, several young women who were former or current BJU students came forward with remarkably similar stories. Their stories included being sexually abused at some point in their life prior to attending BJU, uh, either in the past by a friend or a family member Or in the case of Kate Landry, who has agreed to have her name associated with this, she was assaulted at her summer job that she was working to pay for BJU tuition. So each of these young women approached a staff member from the biblical counseling department. Staff members who were trained in biblical counseling, which is the Fundy version of therapy, and should have been trained to help these young women. But one by one, in different decades, by different staff members, all of these young women were told a variation on the same theme. They were told that their secret sins had caused their abusers to abuse them as a punishment from God. Mm. I... I say I never get used to hearing. I think this Ugh. next little bit is the worst of the victim blaming. So hold Jesus on to your hats here. In Christ, dude, what the yeah. hell? It is the same formula as Bill Gothard, who said, if you were assaulted, it's your fault. Either you were signaling that you were open to it or it is a judgment. It's a punishment for other sins that are not sexual sins. They were told God will forgive you for the sin of being raped. But for that to happen, you have to forgive your rapist first. One young woman was told that she needed to repent of any pleasure that she may have felt while being raped. 
Another was told that the nightmares following her rape were her own fault because she was choosing to replay pornographic thoughts in her mind. I, uh, I, I am at a, I'm at such a loss for words right now. I don't even, that is, is peak fundy victim blaming. This is like, I don't know how to react to this. This is beyond f- up even by fundy standards man this is like holy i mean unfortunately i have heard variations on each of these themes before i have heard things just as bad from pulpits in front of crowds of people and who knows who got triggered in that crowd or who it's so harmful like even if you're not the specific target of that that's still fucked up thing to hear that's well, it also, it also, you know, it leads to things like thinking um, if any, if you are the victim of anything, that it is God punishing you for a secret sin. So if my wallet gets stolen, uh, it's God punishing me. Um, somebody steps out from a dark alley and hits me in the head with a baseball bat, that that's God's punishment. And and then anything that goes wrong in your life is suddenly a punishment from God. And and that's not healthy. So you've been on the receiving end. So this, end- hurts, yeah. this hurts people who have been raped or assaulted the most. But it also hurts everyone. <laughs> Yeah, because you in a lesser way. You talk like two weeks ago when we were talking about summer camp. You talked about being on the receiving end of, of, of like the secret sin idea, and like exactly how powerful that was. Does that so is the power that that has over you? Is that going to hinge on how sold out you are to the, the 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 I guess whatever fundamentalism you're a part of? Or I don't think it has anything to do with how sold out a person is because. People who are, regardless of their religious beliefs, people who have been victims of rape and sexual assault already commonly feel like they did something to cause it. It's so common. It is It is not correct, but that is a very, very normal part of the process of grieving and assault um, to feel that it was your fault in some way. And abusers who abuse repeatedly will often use that rhetoric as well. They'll tell victims that they wanted it or that something the victim did incited the abuser to abuse. Like, oh, I couldn't help myself from doing this to you because of X thing that you did. So, Rather than seeing this as an effect of being sold out, I see this as an effect of preying on emotions that victims already commonly experience. And I think that's where the power of this rhetoric comes from. So when we hear about like several, like a dozen or so victims coming forward, I I, I don't know how many we were talking about in this specific case, but if there's several survivors, that's indicative that there's probably hundreds over the mm. years who, who reported something to the administration and they were guilted into keeping quiet or... There were even more who didn't report anything and they just kept quiet because they'd been so conditioned by fundamentalism and guilt and culture and everything to just they just guilted themselves into not reporting it. I would absolutely assume so. We're going to talk about the Grace Report in a minute, which gives us a better idea of how many victims there might be. Uh, I do agree that there are people who reported and then there are people who didn't report and there are multiple different reasons a person might not have reported this mistreatment. So when I talk about people coming forward with these experiences, I don't want to give the impression that it was quick. This was more like a trickle of stories coming out and becoming known over several years, some of them before the internet. So when we found out about Jack Scott, it was so fast. We went from thinking everything was normal and fine to finding out that he had been immoral and then literally, quote unquote, an immoral um, a child molester. And then yeah. literally like 12 hours after that, most of the story was common knowledge, right down to even knowing how he got caught because there were pictures on his cell phone. And this was the opposite of that. But then something happened that was a catalyst for something actually being done at Bob Jones University. So I feel like we have talked about this before on the show or maybe in the Facebook group. I can't remember. Uh, There was an IFB church in New Hampshire where a man in the church raped a 15-year-old babysitter. She uh, got pregnant. She was subjected to church discipline for, quote, immorality. 
while her rapist faced no consequences and was allowed to continue being a full member of the church. And then the young woman was forced to give birth to the baby. Uh, Turns out the pastor, Chuck Phelps, knew about the whole thing. He knew the guy was dangerous before he assaulted this young woman, and he still allowed this young girl to babysit for his children. And then when she got pregnant, he arranged for her church discipline and arranged to have her sent away to have the baby, all of that. Yeah, so... This is ringing. You know when we talked about this? When did we talk about this? We talked about this when we talked about the Christian Law Association. We talked about uh, Terry Stivo. Right. 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 So I don't know if I mentioned at that point that Chuck Phelps was on the board of Bob Jones University when all of this broke. Of course he was. So Mm. people didn't like find out about this for several years after it happened. But uh, Bob Jones University knew about everything that he had facilitated and let him remain on the board. And he was still on the board when the scandal broke, even after he had resigned from his church. And there was like a whole lawsuit about it, too. Yeah, And he had already resigned from his church over this and was still on the board of Bob Jones. And the university still knew about it. He resigned from the church and Bob Jones didn't distance themselves from him or or make him resign. No. Mm. So in 2011... The first ever protest was held on Bob Jones University campus when a soon to be soon to graduate senior named Chris Peterman protested uh, Chuck Phelps continued position on the board. This kicked off the Do Right BJU online movement, which has spawned online movements like Do Right HAC. Chuck Phelps resigned from the board when public pressure got too much for him. But Bob Jones University expelled Chris Peterman, who did the protest, nine days before he would have graduated. For what they claim Mm. are reasons unrelated to the protest. Wow. Okay, so so they just took his money and didn't give him the... Yep. That's so that's what they do, though. Institutions like this and also like fascist states is they'll have extremely restrictive rules that are selectively enforced, but that nobody is actually in compliance with, like pretty much everyone's in violation of something. So if anybody's ever a problem, then they just have legal cover to arrest them or punish them or get rid of them or whatever they do so that they can just say, well, actually, this person was a criminal and they're unrelated to to, and, and, well, kind of like yeah. how anybody, like everybody breaks the speed limit and everybody drives with the tail light out that they don't know is out sometimes. But police officers who are racist can use that as an excuse to pull somebody over and then commit hate crimes against them. Kind of like that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, similar, similar thing. I mean, they do the same sort of thing in like China or they do this thing in like Saudi Arabia, Iran. Mm hmm. So the rule that Peterman was actually expelled for is still on the rule book. I checked. Uh, He had said negative things about the university on social media. And I see where you're coming from Mm. with the idea that this is a rule that anybody could and probably does violate. Because what if, okay, this is an extreme example, maybe, but what if somebody just posted a photo of a dining hall meal and said that it was gross? And then a year later, the university wanted to get rid of them for an unrelated reason. Well, then they'd have an excuse to do so. So this is literally a thing that you can get arrested for in China. Right. If you, if you say bad things about the Chinese Communist Party on uh, social media in China, then they can arrest you or they can negatively affect your social credit or whatever the f- Right. Weird dystopian system they have over there. So, and this is where it gets even ickier, in my opinion. It was in response to the Phelps scandal, not the many reported instances of campus sexual assault perpetrated by students or staff members, not the many reported instances of counselors who were employed by and trained by the university mishandling reports of previous sexual assaults. It wasn't those things. It was the Phelps scandal that made BJU hire a company called Grace to conduct an external investigation of the college's practices. So is Grace a Christian org? Yeah. Because that sounds that sounds like that would be like a backronym for like a, a Christian org. It's a backronym they- for godly response to abuse in the Christian environment. I do want to say as far as Christian organizations that conduct external investigations of other Christian uh, organizations... Grace is about as legit as they come. So they didn't, you could argue that they did half-ass it by hiring a Christian organization, but they did hire about the best one out there. And Bob Jones wasn't going to hire an organization that wasn't Christian. 
Right. So, you know, I can't really criticize them for hiring Grace. I can criticize them for firing Grace, which they did after a few weeks of the investigation because they didn't like the way that the investigation was going. Wow. They they didn't they didn't like the way that they they hired them to investigate into themselves and they didn't like that man. The the backlash mm. was so bad that they did rehire Grace to complete the report eventually. Wow. God. These they're allergic to any kind of accountability, aren't they? This is Man, you have to really hold their feet to the fire. You have to drag them kicking and screaming like they're little children. You got to make Yeah, so they hired a company to hold their feet to the fire and then fired them because they were doing that. It's too hot. I don't like it. And then other people held their feet to the fire even harder. So they rehired the original company. God, what a show. Man. Okay, so so what so what's Grace's consent? Uh, so what's Grace's consensus? About half of the survivors interviewed by Grace were abused previously. So Grace interviewed 116 people. Grace says about 50 of them identified as victims. BJU's website says that 40 pe- about 40 identify as victims. I guess 50 is about 40. I don't know why there's that discrepancy. But about half of the people that did identify as victims that were interviewed by Grace, uh, the abuse in question happened previous to their enrollment at BJU, and they were mistreated and victim blamed when they reported this past abuse to a staff member in the ways that we've talked about previously. About 37% of the people that identified themselves as victims that were interviewed by Grace were abused by a fellow student or a current staff member at the college at the time of their enrollment, which is bad. That That's not good. That's, um, yeah. The rest were abused during their time at BJU, but not by a current staff member or fellow student. The New York Times article I linked about this has results from an online survey where as many as 166 people identified as victims. Uh, I guess that is not, I guess the total number that were actually interviewed by Grace was 116. Yeah. And I mean, like at any university, at any college or university, there's going to be sexual, like we we know that that, that's just a problem everywhere. It just is. Yeah. Um, This is, this is a thing that happens yeah, at any college or university, and we've got to fix that on a societal level, have a society that creates fewer abu- abusers. And there's a certain amount of that is that is just going like you can't prevent all crimes happening. But what you have to do is you're like it, it, the, the real telling thing is if there's a response to it, because there's always going to be bad people around and you can't. Like you can't always root them out beforehand, but what you have to do is you have to have a strong response to the people that do, like the, right, and, and, and a protective response towards people that are victims of any crime, but especially sexual violence. And yeah. that's where BJU f-ed up. Yeah, and so they're they're just not having that level of accountability, and so that's where that's where we really see a problem. So this statement that BJU that's probably written by their lawyers, hundred percent chance that that's written by their lawyers. The thing that I have to keep remembering here, I'm like. I, I like how is this legal? How is this legal? Like, how are they allowed to remain open? Is that Title IX does not apply to private religious schools? So all this stuff that's really this really egregious victim blaming stuff does not actually count technically as a violation of the Civil Rights Act under federal law because these schools can get away with it because Title IX doesn't apply to them. Okay, so it's already like because it's already difficult if you go to like an actual university to get a successful if you're abused it's difficult to get a successful claim through under title nine even if they do everything right like even if they yeah um and they might not because this is a problem that is that is all over colleges and universities yeah and it's like it's always very messy and there's always like and and the 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 perpetrators can often bring in like saying, oh, well, like, like and, and do all sorts of things to, to question the credibility and play all sorts of dirty tricks. And then they can do that really easily. And it's really difficult to actually get something through, get something like get like an actual strong decision. Right. Um, somebody asked me in the Facebook group the other day uh, if I could speak to men and assigned male at birth people who are sexually abused in fundamentalism and whether the response is different to them than to women and AFAB people who are sexually abused or victims of sexual violence. 
And my take on that was in the secular world, the response to women and AFAB people who are victims of sexual violence is bad. And the response to men and AMAB people who are victims is worse. And then in the fundy world, the response to women who are victims, women and AFAB people who are victims is worse than the secular response to men and AMAB people. And then the fundy response to men and AMAB people is even worse yet than the response to women and AFAB people. So no it's surprise <laughs> there. there. Nobody is doing good, but some people are doing worse than other people. Victims interviewed by Grace reported very similar victim blaming tactics across the board to the first few stories that I told you about earlier. They also reported that on-campus assaults were reported to campus security, but never properly reported to law enforcement. The university, Mm. of course, wants to cover their ass. They say that they never told victims not to report to law enforcement. But whether or not that is true, it is clear that they did not uphold mandatory reporting standards. They may not have been legally required to uphold mandatory reporting standards, because like you said, they're not subject to Title IX, they morally should have upheld mandatory reporting standards, regardless of their legal requirement. So a quote from the New York Times that sums up the GRACE recommendations really well, quote, GRACE recommended overhauling the university's policies on sexual assault, outsourcing victim counseling, offering assistance to past victims, reviewing old complaints to find those that should have been reported to law enforcement, and halting the use of counseling booklets and videos developed by some university officials. So the the counseling booklets, and so they're using counseling booklets and videos that they made themselves. So it's like the, the thing that HAC did with the Jack Scott book with the healing for the inner hurt when they... Yes, but it's a little bit worse than that. Worse? Yeah. So James Berg was the head of the biblical counseling department. He and his wife, Pat, were both high ups in the biblical counseling department. They are the primary people that these reports of past sexual abuse were made to. They are the people, Pat Berg, Jim Berg's wife, was the person who told one young woman that it was her fault that she was having nightmares of her sexual assault because she was replaying pornographic thoughts in her mind. <clears throat> these are the people who were saying these things. These are the primary culprits, though certainly not the only culprits, of the victim blaming that was going on. Jim Berg, James Berg, wrote the books that were used as the, as the curriculum in the biblical counseling department. He wrote the book he he wrote the book on how to victim blame people and then he taught his own book to his students and taught them how to victim blame people and then those students mm. became staff in the biblical counseling department at BJU and victim blamed people what so that's, that's what Grace is referencing. Get rid of Berg. Don't let him on staff. Don't let him teach on counseling. Don't let him perform counseling on campus and get rid of his books as curriculum. Stop publishing them through the university press and stop using them in classes. This is like, you know, you, you know, 30 Rock, you know, the oh, yeah. vertical integration on 30. This is like <laughs> vertical integration, a, just a different. Le- so what like, the- I don't want to make it out that this guy was this the only not- problem. But this guy was the source of a lot of this guy and his wife were the source of a good portion of the problem, just the two of them. So that's what Grace was saying. It's like, this guy is a huge part of the problem. You need to just ditch him and like half your problem will be solved. <laughs> yeah. So it. But the, oh, this so is okay. like. So- <laughs> This is the thing that make like it's almost as if like these these uh, fundamental they they almost operate in the sense of like a monarchy. You know what I'm saying? Where there's this mm. idea that well, okay, well if the king is good, then uh the then the people will prosper, and if the king is like, and they just assume that everybody who's fundamentalist is is good, and therefore the things that they do and the things that they teach are good, then they teach. And so it's so focused on like one person having this much power to make this much policy decision. And if that person is horribly, horribly, like there's no accountability to them. There's no checks and balances on their power and there's no like review processed. Oh my God. So this let's is- talk about the, the good and the bad of BJU's response to this. So here's yeah. the good. They did decide to follow some of Grace's recommendations. 
they did issue a public apology for the victim blaming, which was a good apology. One thing is, uh, BJU does know how to make a sincere apology. Sometimes they choose to do so, and sometimes they choose to qualify it with things that are still shit but they do know how to make a good apology that is actually sincere when they want to. They did overhaul some official policies. They There was only one survivor, according to them, who said that she did not complete her degree because of the mishandling of her sexual assault case, and they offered her a free ride to complete her degree either at Bob Jones University or at another university of her choice. They would pay for it all. That's good. They, the way they phrased it made me think that they were going to make her jump through some really triggering hoops to get there. Because in the official statement, it said this survivor knows who she is and she can call the president's office and can speak with the president directly about this scholarship. That seems unreasonable to ask of a survivor. But And why would you say that publicly? Right. Wouldn't say like, that they pub- didn't like- name her, but like this felt icky to me. And I feel like there is something there that I don't know that is icky. But the fact that they said that they would give her a free ride to complete her degree, um, that is the right thing to do. That part of it. The fact that they claim there was only one survivor who fits this qualifications seems unlikely. So there's some good and bad there. BJU also provided and still provides mandatory abuse prevention training every year to all staff and students, which is good. They also designated every staff member and employee as a mandatory reporter, which is great. The bad part is (laughs) that where I get off the this is good train is when in their response, they very smugly inform us that designating every staff member and employee as a mandatory reporter exceeds both state and federal legal requirements like you did the right thing can you not be so f-ing smug about it you did the right thing after being wrong about everything for, for years and years and years, years and hurting like, a lot of people you literally had the guy who is teaching people how to victim blame teaching all of your classes on how to victim he blame. Wrote, yep he wrote the book on how to victim blame and then you were teaching that as your <clears> and, and <throat> when you were giving that but uh, we exceeded man. state and federal legal legal requirements when we were forced to. So let's have our gold star for that now. Aside from the s- clear scam of assigning your own book as course material in the class that you teach, beyond that, I just I just had to throw that out there. When professors do that, they I don't know. They, so so that was the good yeah. and the sort of good. Now for the bad. James Berg is no longer the head of the Biblical Counseling Department, but he is still on staff at BJU, according to their website. And in the official response from the president to the Grace Report, the college released an infuriating statement about the fact that they will be continuing to use his books as curriculum. And just to, just to rub salt in the wound of every survivor... The statement that they will continue to have him on staff is in the same section as the formal apology for mishandling sexual assault. So why are they so allergic to getting rid of these people? Is it just like, I I won't do what you tell me? Or have they calculated that basically the people going to BJU just don't care? Or like... I can read you I, what they said about him. Maybe that would help you understand. Okay. Okay, so then this is from the official response to the Grace Report. I have that linked for you. Here's the quote. With regard to the writings of Jim Berg, we have reviewed his written material on a wide variety of topics and have found them to be faithful to scripture. Obviously, as would be expected of any writer, his later works reflect the benefit of ongoing growth and mastery of his subject matter. Thousands of believers have benefited from his books and hundreds of churches have used his materials with great spiritual profit. And then it's just got a long list of like his accomplishments and like where he has been published. And these are the other colleges that still use his work. So we're fine. Uh, Finishing the quote, we will continue to use these materials in our courses and make them available in our campus store and through BJU Press. Mm -hmm. So the answer is, well, he's done a lot of good for a lot of people. But these are the people who will like, you can't sit with us over. Associating with Catholics. (laughs) associating with somebody who associates with somebody who associates with Catholics, then right. you're like, <laughs> then, then they're like, you know, I don't know, like, like write dozens and dozens and dozens of letters denouncing you in publications and spread them out everywhere and say that you're unbiblical and unchristian. But like, 
if you tell people that their PTSD nightmares are their own fault and they need to repent for their pornographic. Th- yeah. This is- the the entire response is incredibly self-righteous. I have to say, making any changes at all is better than any average IFB institution would ever do. On the other hand, this response is still pretty gross. So I think it would be fun. Uh, let's, uh, let's take a really quick breeze through the current rule book to wrap this one up. Okay, cool. I've, I need a palate cleanser, man. I really do. I, just, we all do. And I think I can make an interesting point out of this. So let's just yeah, like, let's just, just like pop through the rule book and see what we find. Yeah, just need a different flavor on my tongue. Just I gotcha. Rules at, rules at BJU. Are they going to be as strict at HAC or are they going to be more lenient? They are almost exactly the same as Pensacola Christian College. The main difference that I see is that AFAB people can wear pants for most college activities. Okay, so Hiles Anderson is out here. Hiles Anderson says that BJU is teaching young Christians to be sloppy. Well, men are allowed to have beards as long as they're trimmed to half an inch or less. And beards also may not be started on campus, which cracked me up. So yeah, BJU is clearly a bunch of sloppy liberals. Let me see. What can I pull out for you here? So they also don't make students attend Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night. It's just Sunday morning plus one additional church service of the student's choice. They don't even have chapel every single day of the week, and there's no soul winning requirement. So like I said, super liberal. Really? That's yeah. surprising. Okay. I, I mean, I would have thought that at BJU, they'd have you on your knees at least three times a week. Well, chapel is three times a week. It's just not five times a week like HAC. And then there's two <laughs> discipleship groups per week. It's an extremely complicated point system that you have to learn in order to make sure that you went to enough church, which seems like a user unfriendly nightmare. It's just like a lot of brain power. Yeah, this is what gave me on that. Yeah, this is what gave me like really big PCC vibes. There's all these rules, but they all have caveats and you basically need a flow chart to understand what you're allowed to do. Some rules are pretty much the same as HAC. Men and women can't be in a room alone together, no physical contact. But this is a direct quote from the current rule book. Side hugs are permitted for photographs. <laughs> For photographs. Wow. So if you want a picture with your boyfriend or girlfriend, you can put your arm around them. And I, it is not in the rule book. I guarantee there is an informal rule about how many seconds your side hug can last. Actually, you weren't getting your picture taken. So you still would have possibly been expelled from BJU for Mm -hmm. your side hug. But if I had had somebody stand there with a camera, it would have been fine, apparently. Yeah, it's the same as uh, the legality of sex work apparently geez <laughs> so, well, so i mean i'm not wrong you no, you're not <laughs> um and i wonder if there are people who use that rule to get around the physical contact rule just like Kinky. there are people who use that <laughs> law to get around certain sex work activities that would be interesting oh, to know man so the rule book is very cagey about physical contact rules It says that sensual contact is prohibited, but there's no list of things you can't do. Like at Hiles Anderson, there's a list. No kissing, no hugging, no holding hands, no touching. But there isn't that. Like, you don't get a list like that at BJU. So BJU doesn't teach you what sensual contact even is? No. So I had to check with Liz. And Hmm. she said that nothing is no holding hands, no contact at all. They're just being really cagey about it. Couples may not go off campus without a chaperone, but mixed groups of three or more people may if the group does not separate. I'm sure this works great, and nobody uses it for nefarious purposes at all, ever. Also, engaged couples may go on unchaperoned dates under specific conditions with written parental approval. And I just have to ask, can you imagine having your parents have to sign off for you to go off the college campus to go on a date during daytime hours within a prescribed geographical area with your college senior fiance. Oh man, I'm Jewish. I have to answer questions about who she is, what's her name, what's her major, what her career goals are. Does she want kids? If so, how many? If she likes Pacific Northwest and wants to live nearby, what she plans to do after school. If she's considered postgraduate programs at PSU or Lewis and Clark so that we can remain close in proximity to my parents. I feel like your parents would know Uh, that if you were engaged, unless you like... that's just true, engage, engaged, unless you just yeah. like got fake engaged so that you could date off campus, which I'm sure nobody ever does ever. No one's ever done that. Definitely yeah. not. 
Although these are the fundies. So if you get fake, you can't get fake engaged. Calling off an engagement, that's like calling off a courtship. You can't do that. No, that's like, that's the HAC fundies. These people are like a little bit more normal. Man. Just racist. So here's a fun one for you. It is plainly written in the rule book. The rule book that is very cagey about most things felt the need to spell this one out. (laughs) Students, quote, are not to patronize businesses that specialize in adult gifts and party items. Adult gifts and and party items. This is the college that makes incoming freshmen wear a button that says first BJ. Because it is their first year at Bob Jones University. This is, man. But you just... can't go to an adult store, apparently. Okay, I thought adult gifts and party items. It's like you go to Spencer's Gifts at the mall and they're going to throw you out of BJU. They what, will. Like, they will, sp- apparently, which seems what? wrong. What is what is party items? Is party items like like a party hat? Like a, I mean, I was like, thinking whippets, but apparently... Like, birthday candles birthday like candles. i got so okay so what's the enforcement like for these rules where are they like are you getting kicked out for stuff are you getting like a, a suspension are you getting there's like, a what? whole there's a flow chart for that because of course there is there's like you can be on like academic probation or like sus- probationary something or other and then there's suspension and then there's expulsion there's like all these rules it's like trying to get fired from a corporate job where you get like a, you get a verbal warning and then you get a written warning and then you get a meeting with so and so and then you get this and then you get that and then you're on probation and then you get fired. It's like that. I mean, it makes sense at BJU. There's going to be teeth to it. <laughs> uh. So they have filtered internet access and don't directly <laughs> ban secular music, movies, or books. They have a very cagey and like Christianese definition of what is allowed. It's effectively going to ban anything that your RA doesn't like on a particular day. For example, the yeah. statement on music. Uh, all musical choices are to be intentionally conservative in style and are to avoid the markers of our current corrupt culture. Because the following musical styles consistently express these markers, students should avoid rock, pop, jazz, country, rap, and hip-hop. Okay, r- so rock, pop, jazz, country, rap, Hip hop. So disco's fine though. EDM is fine. Okay, so I can put on some drum and bass or like some Chicago hard style, and they're not going to be able to do anything. Soundtrack to Saturday Night Fever. Yeah, exactly. There's some Bee Gees. Get some some. Oh, I love the Bee Gees, uh, man. I love the Bee Gees too. No, you put on uh, <clears throat> "Ring My Bell" by Anita Ward. They're not going to be able to say shit about that. That's that's disco. I, man. I did also find this list hilarious, and I wanted to add in that. Because of lists like this, when I was a kid, I thought that records came with a label on them that told you what kind of like CDs came with a label on them that told you what kind of music it was. So it would like say rock in the corner or like say jazz. (laughs) And I was like not aware that there are a lot of crossovers between those categories. They're also not going to have a, a label on it that says specifically what kind of satanic act this record is going to influence you to do either sadly. unless it's king diamond in which case it totally will actually that would be a great way to tell like to to, to market your music be like this if listening to this record will make you want to listening to this record will make you want to do drugs listening to this record will make you want to murder people and steal things listening to this like that's the, this, the mayhem's records will all have this record will lead to arson <laughs> this record will lead you to uh, uh, uh hate crimes and uh hate crimes and arson, um, <laughs> arson and- <laughs> so uh let's move on to dress code dress women's, code all right women's dress code uh and i'm gonna switch to, to using women and men um because that's how the college does it just for this section women's dress code no unnatural hair colors no barbell piercings, no visible tattoos, skirts to the top of the knee, no crop tops. Pants are acceptable in most situations. Classroom attire means no denim or jeans or denim skirts, no shirts with logos, no vis- visible stitching, like top stitching on pants, no camo, no flip flops for class. Jeans and flip flops are acceptable for non class, non chapel, non church activities. And dresses are only dresses or skirts are only explicitly required for certain formal events. So, do they have anything about like what, what your neckline can be? Uh, I think it's just no cleavage. No cleavage, which is a, a, a good bit more relaxed. So BJU is fine with neck. So the men's dress code <laughs> is. 
Oh, I'm man. becoming suspicious of your comments at this point <laughs> in the episode. Man, I, at the beginning, I was just trying to pepper them in, see if I can oh, fly no. under the radar. And oh no, no. <laughs> I'm so, just like uh, I'm just it's it's late it's it's hot in this bedroom I'm just like I'm in a fucking, closet I'm, I'm gonna have the, to come out of this closet after BJU just like Liz did <laughs> <laughs> hey yo ah, that was a good one that was a good one uh, that was great I hope BJU, they think it's funny it's a great place for uh, a religious nut oh no <laughs> <laughs> have you been doing this the whole time? Yes, oh, I have Lord. been doing this the whole time. <laughs> Men's uh, dress code. You're in trouble because you have piercings now. I do have piercings now. Short hair, no unnatural colors, hair cannot touch, collar ears or eyebrows, short beards under half an inch acceptable, but you may not start a beard while, it's, while on campus, which is funny because they just don't want people looking like schlubby. Um, but that did, that cracked me up. Uh, one necklace is allowed. <laughs> Liberal. No earrings on men. Uh, class appropriate business casual attire means no jeans, no sweatpants, no basketball shorts. Khakis are the minimum for classroom. Jeans are allowed when you're not in class. Collared shirts for class. No shirts with large logos. No camo. No flip flops. I do not know why, but this no camo rule is cracking me up. Just one thing real quick. I think that it would be a shame to go necklace at BJU. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Yeah, no, the the no camo rule. I feel like that's one that they just like after Duck Dynasty hit. They're just like, it has to stop. It that is that is a look. I've been to more than one Funday College. That is the kind of rule that came about because of a person. <laughs> there are certain rules at every Funday College that came about because of an individual person. At Hiles Anderson, it's about not spray painting the geese, which you shouldn't do anyway because of animal cruelty. But <laughs> these are the people that eat fish, Gavi. <laughs> yeah. Speaking of, um. At BJU, it's against the rules to walk on the grass on campus, but students may have pet fish, which is something that I've never heard from a Fundy college before and definitely different from Hiles Anderson where they eat the pet fish. Do they have hedges at BJU? I don't know. Hmm. Oh, no, I do know. They used to. They used to have them all the way around the campus, but then the current president came out and said, you know, we feel like this separates us from the community and we want to be a part of the community, so we're taking them down. Oh, so they trimmed the hedges for easier oh, access. no. no. <laughs> <laughs> I walked into that one. So to top it all off, <laughs> I let you do that one to me. Um, yeah, just like they let you do it at BJU. <laughs> to, to finish our jaunt through the BJU rulebook, CBD gummies are specifically mentioned in the rulebook as a drug. Do they know what do they know what CBD does? I 100% guarantee that they do not. No one and in knew honor it, of that rule, no I have been drinking my lovely lemon CBD soda throughout this episode. No one knew what CBD was until like 4 years ago. How they had to Do they have do they have a rule of, I guess it's like all weird white people that go to the school. Do they have a rule about kratom too? You know I did not I do not recall saying kratom in the rule book if you want to have like a whites only school you tell them that kratom is okay like that's the only people who like yeah so you allow something that is way more untested and can have way more serious like health effects than cbd but you don't allow cbd yeah man that's i mean that's what they do they're like inject bleach and inject uh yeah, is, I wonder is ivermectin allowed on campus? Yeah, man, no ivermectin. Whatever the. F- so there is a reason. <laughs> There's a very good reason that I wanted to end this huge, huge episode by looking at the rules. BJU markets itself as being so much more palatable than HAC. The campus is nicer. The degrees get you further in life. Maybe they get you a real job. The rules are slightly more lenient. The campus life is much more bearable. They have more amenities. They have, they have real college sports now, like local, they play against local colleges. 
They do everything in their power to look like a legitimate Christian university. And in the process of doing this, they attempt to minimize and paint over their racist, homophobic past and the damage that they have done as an institution to people of color, to LGBTQ people, and to victims of sexual assault. It's the same fundamentalism in prettier packaging. And not only that, I believe that it is the hope of the institution as a whole that this prettier packaging will allow them to retain or at this point regain the position as the flagship of fundamentalism that they once held. Don't be fooled. I think that's a good note to end on. Thank you for tuning into this episode. I, it was fascinating to learn about all of this stuff, especially the history of fundamentalism. Wow. I did learn a lot about uh, about that in this episode. I did learn a lot and also about American history. Um, if you like our show, if you're a fan of our show, uh, make sure you hit that subscribe button. I may have some Jack Scott updates before too long. We have some theories that are... Uh, we have some theories that I've been working extremely hard on behind the scenes. Yeah. Uh, so stay tuned for that. Uh, if it, you can join our our Facebook group at facebook.com slash group slash Eden Exodus. Join our subreddit reddit.com slash r slash Eden Exodus. You can join our Patreon where there is an extremely extended version of today's episode, including many, many, many more disgusting jokes that I make that you definitely don't want to hear uh, about BJU. Uh, apologies to anybody with sensitive ears who is listening to this and uh, had to listen through that. Um, you can join you can follow us on facebook and instagram at leaving eden podcast on twitter at leaving eden pod sadie do you want to plug your social media absolutely you can follow me on instagram at sadie carpenter music on twitter at hell yeah sadie or on tiktok at sadie carpenter one and you can follow me at facebook and instagram and twitter at g-a-v-r-i-e-l-h-a-c-o-h-e-n thank you so much you guys have a great day bye Yeah.